and welcome to the, and I'm going to get this round, try and get this round the way, Government Law and Policy Track, have I got it the right way around? Yes, I've been, I've been sort of uh, trying to get it in random orders all week and probably will continue to do so. Uh, my name is Judy Parnell, I'm from the BBC's Research and Development Department, where I look after get, how do we actually fit all that, those interesting technology that we develop, some of which you can see down on the first floor, plug, plug, um, and uh, get it out into the industry. Is that by using it? We're big users of open source, we're big users of uh, open standards. In fact, we are uh, obliged to use to be open. And uh, so that, uh, this fits really in our comfort zone. Um, got some really interesting sessions this afternoon. Unfortunately, if you will have, if you've seen in your agenda, that uh, Jennifer Bath is going to be uh, talking about the state of open. Unfortunately, she's unable to be with us. Um, she's not well following uh, surgery. Um, and so uh, that slot, I'm afraid, is uh, we've had to take out. But hopefully, uh, Jennifer will come and talk to us at another event later. Um, we're going to start with a summary of the state of open from geopolitics to GDP. From someone you might have be aware of, the force of nature, that is Amanda Brock, uh, the CEO's State of Open. Uh, Amanda, come on up. Um. Right, so somebody probably has to come and help me with the tech because they haven't got the adapters and I'm in the light like a rabbit. Um. Do we have a tech in the room? It's supposed to be a B and C or A to C. I may have one in my handbag, but I may not. Sorry. I have a lot of slides for you because I had no slides this morning. I feel that I ought to give you some. And I think you've got me on both mics. Thank you. I, I need a, they're supposed to be in every room. I know they're supposed to be in every room because I spec'd it. Um, a dance move. I was listening to Damani and do his dance. A passive aggressive. I don't know. That's quite. <laughs> so I've never understood why when I walk up to people they stay still, right? Or why they take my calls. Because I've seen them joking about it afterwards and it's like, what does she make you do? Yet they still keep standing still when I walk towards them or when I phone them, they pick up the phone and they end up doing something, which is partly why there are so many people. Um, it's gone off again. There's so many people who are uh, involved in this conference, and I don't know if they've got me on two mics. Is the mic, is the mic okay? Can you hear me properly? Yeah. Great. So I'm going to show you more slides than you've ever seen in about 15 to 20 minutes, because I like pictures, and I didn't get to do any this morning. I think you've got my other mic switched on. Okay, let's see if that's it. So I'm going to talk to you about from geopolitics to GDPR, which will probably have a quite a, a UK slant to it. And I mentioned this morning my beloved Canonical, which I joined 15 years ago and which sort of got me into open source. And I, I know Salim, who was on the panel with me this morning, because I used to chair an advisory board for the UN. And that, that experience at Canonical for me was really, really fundamental because I didn't really know what open source was. And I was a commercial technology lawyer who'd been brought into an organization to help them run the commercial side of it. They were wanting me to do deals. And before I knew it, I'd totally fallen in love with open source. And that was a complete, you know, that, that was not on the horizon or on the agenda at all. And that's led me to do a, a number of different projects around open source since, including the, the work with the UN until I'm now on the UK's Open Standards Boards, which... Um, Sadly, it's not as taxing as it should be. We don't meet very often, uh, something that we need to address. And this last year, I was elected. I, I stood for an election for the first time in my life. And it's not a very comfortable process, to be honest. I didn't particularly like being elected. But I was elected to the Open Source Initiatives Board. So I, I sit on that now as well. And I spend a lot of my time traveling around, uh, speaking to people like this, during lockdown, mostly to my cat in my kitchen. And last year. So on Friday, I'm having three weeks holiday. I've not had a holiday in a year because last year we published this book. And it was a good idea at the time, five years ago, when we spec'd it and we said, let's build this book. There'd been a first edition. I'd asked my professor who had edited the first edition to do the second one. And he said, no, you do it. 
So I thought, oh, I'll go and do it then. But I hadn't realised what I was taking on. And we had 26 authors who did 24 chapters. And a lot of them are lawyers. It's, you know, herding cats. So five years of work later, we published a 640-page book in October. And I have ADHD. And once it was completed and we'd edited the individual chapters, it, I had to read it five times from beginning to end. So I can tell you, if you really want to focus, it takes four days to read. Um, but don't tell me if there are typos. Tell the, the, tell the publisher. I, I don't think I could cope with it. Now, the beauty of it, it's not that anybody's making money. So the only person who gets paid for this is me. And I don't care. And if you scan that barcode and you want to use it for non-commercial purposes, it's open access. And that was sponsored by the Beach Foundation. So I, I think it's a really useful text. And we worked really hard to index it to try and make it something that would be, you know, it would have real utility. I don't expect any of you to read it. We are giving some away tomorrow. We have five different book signings. I think one happened at lunchtime already. So on the third floor, you can get copies of this if you want it. Uh, it's quite thick if you need to stand on something to reach a top shelf. Um, and as you know from this morning, I lead Open UK. You probably didn't get a sense this morning quite how many people are regularly involved in Open UK as volunteers. So we normally have a staff of two. We've gone to six to organise this conference. So we've had three or four people join us, um, not all full time, but join us to organise this. And then everybody else is a volunteer which is where my passive aggressive behavior comes out. <laughs> but I persuade them to do all sorts of different things for us and it works really well and it brings the open technology communities in the UK together. And I've mentioned to you today that we're very focused on belonging. And we want to build a, a cohesive community with a voice. We have a community at our heart. We want to influence laws and policies and we want to make the UK a great place to, to do uh, open source. And uh, this is what we were talking about a little bit this morning. Uh, well, no, it's not actually. This is Oracle v. Google, which is something we responded to. We were part of an amicus brief with some other open source organizations a couple of years ago. I think we were the only non-US organization that engaged. And then we responded to the executive order when there was an opportunity post-publication for the consultation. So our remit is UK leadership, but global collaboration. So we keep an eye on what's going on. A lot of the, the figures people have been quoting comes from our reporting in 21 and 22. Um, she was talking about the potential spend on open source software and the benefits back to the UK economy to GDP. And we should have a report. We were hoping to get it out today, but it'll be out on Friday. It doesn't have an economic increase, but it does cover some of this. And we, we do a lot of work around sustainability. We actually have an event on the 15th of September at Dynamic Earth in Edinburgh. And we try to do something each year after COP26 because we did a major event at COP26 and we found a great alignment between uh, open technology and the sustainable development goals. And this year you will see, I think either later today or tomorrow, Chris Lloyd-Jones, who runs our blueprints now, talking about our EV charging blueprint, which is the, the second project. The first was a, a data center blueprint. And actually, Open UK is going to take a much more active role in these blueprints. We think they're a great way of sharing information because we bring together software, hardware, data in a format that people can use. I'm stuck with it, so I'm hooked to this. Um, we bring it together in a format that people can use and learn from and keep adding to. And that's something that we want to do more of and encourage other people to pick up the blueprint template. So part of the reason we did a second one was that it allowed us to sort of show, you know, do it once and then do it twice and show it's replicable. And uh, I mentioned earlier today, learning is very, very important to us. And we did a, a couple of kids camps. They're still available online and they're Creative Commons if anyone's interested. They're focused on Key Stage 3 filling in some of the gaps in education on open source software. And we got listed, which was a huge surprise to me last summer, as one of eight notable open source software security initiatives, because we ran something called the, the Summer of Open Source Software. And it was a very long summer. It ran all the way through to Christmas in the end. But we had a mixture of sort of uh, webinars, blogs, and uh, podcasts that I think were quite good introductions to different aspects of security and that whole picture of curation that Eric and I were talking about earlier. So the title of this is Geopolitics to GDPR. And people are often surprised that I talk about things like economics or world affairs and open source in the same breath. 
I don't know about you, but my Roaring Twenties started the way I thought they might for a very short space of time, and I thought we were going to have quite an exciting decade, and Europe were heavily pushing their digital decade. Uh, Ursula uh, von der Leyen had just appointed Marguerite Vestager, and I often um, quote this, this quote because I think it is really important, I think it's a really well-written piece. And she appoints Vestager, and when... Um, when she does it, she appoints her as the Digital Minister for Europe, she talks about stuff that applies anywhere in the world, and it's what I was challenging Mike on. I agree with what he said, but it's what I was challenging Mike on earlier, that sovereignty is an issue for every nation, every state, every country, and we have to find a balance between bringing sovereignty back to our own um, sovereign base and also continuing to be able to collaborate. And it's one of the spaces that I think geopolitics really impacts open source in. Um, this is FOSDEM, which I didn't make last weekend, but this is FOSDEM in 2020. Um, I'm with colleagues from Open UK outside the Commission at midnight on the 31st of January. So everybody knows that FOSDEM is on the first Sunday in February. So we were there on, uh, I think it was Friday the 31st or Saturday the 31st. And we were standing at the Commission at midnight and the lights went out. I don't know if they do that every night or if it was just for us for dramatic effect as we brexited, but we were literally in front of the commission building as it happened, standing in the dark. And I mention it, I, I don't care what your view on Brexit is, or you don't care what mine is, it's not relevant. Um, we are in a situation that we're now in, it's happened. And I mention it because that specific <coughs> moment in time, you know, it's not often you can point to a geopolitical act to the second and very rare that you know it's going to happen before it does. So I think Brexit is a unique thing that impacted open source, and it did impact us. Uh, personally, I and another person I know who had been asked to be directors of a foundation that was being set up in Europe, we're told we had to stand down because the commission wouldn't fund if we were part of it. I saw other people <coughs> who were contributing to open source projects, finding that because of funding tied to the commission, they had to step away. And I'm not blaming the Commission. I'm sure the UK did equally stupid things the other way around. But that geopolitical thing really matters. And when you see <coughs> geopolitical shift and split, it doesn't work with collaborative technology. And we all need collaborative technology for the future. So it's, it's sort of why I've talked about this quite a lot. Um, do anybody, anybody know what that is? So that's the Scottish variant of COVID. And you can, tell it's, uh, you can tell it's coming because, frankly, you can hear it before you see it. And we couldn't see COVID coming, right? And it, it got all of us by surprise. And what that did was put us in a position where suddenly, as Eric said, a lot of open source came to the fore. We didn't, and it wasn't, well, it's partly Eric, but also um, Mike Bracken was talking about that. And part of the issue is that well, it really frustrated me, actually, if I take a step back. When we looked at what was happening in March, April, May of 2020, we were all locked up, locked up in our houses, scared. Singapore already had an open source app. Now, it might not have been perfect, but we could have taken it and we could have worked with it and we could have collaborated. But our governments didn't look that way. They looked at, you know, not in my backyard and started to create their own. And we missed a massive opportunity for all of us there that might have stopped us being locked up in our houses until our cats talked. And it's one of those things that, you know, hindsight's a great thing, but we have to learn from. And we see, as Salim was saying about, you know, the UN and the reactions to uh, critical incidents or the reactions to wars and other crises, that we can't keep repeating this. We have to learn that we have to innovate collaboratively and avoid these geopolitical shifts. And in the UK, in the end, we did open source our app, um, Second Attempt, and we threw it over the wall there was no collaboration around the contributions. Whereas if you looked at Germany, what we saw was I think there were over 2,000 contributions from community in the way that they developed their app. And it, you know, it, was, it was a lesson for us all to learn. And I mentioned in the title uh, GDPR. So one of the things that we've seen is SHREMS. Does anybody know what SHREMS is? So SHREMS 1 and SHREMS 2. SHREMS 1 was a, a lawyer's nightmare back when I was a lawyer because we'd all relied on the way that we transferred data between the EU, which we were part of, and third countries. And we relied on being able to use model clauses. So that had already been set aside by Schrems, so it made a lawyer's job harder. This second case had the impact of saying that the US might not be a suitable place to transfer data to. 
Now, what that meant was you actually had to go in and audit, and that was a real act of aggression, not passive aggressive, very directly aggressive from the European Commission to the US. So we started to see through these roaring 20s, through things like GDPR, geopolitical shift happening. And we saw this focus on sovereignty. Open UK is a member of GAIA-X. We were one of the day, day one members, and we're one of only two day one members. And I know that, um, I think he's next door, uh, Francesco Bonfiglioli, if I've got that pronounced properly, is uh, CEO of GAIA-X, and he's talking at our conference. But what you see with GAIA-X is the actual business implementation of those political shifts and those legislative shifts and those court cases that we're looking at. So it wasn't just Europe, and it wasn't just Europe and the US. We also see Europe fo focusing on sovereignty and pushing back against China, the US pushing back against China, and the UK pushing back against China. And it's not just at government level. We see citizens. We see citizens taking to the street, protesting about Black Lives Matter. We see kids in Glasgow demonstrating in the streets at COP26. And by this time last year, maybe a month later, we see war, we see war in Ukraine, which at least for those of us from the UK really felt close to home. So why is this relevant? Well, I, I gave you my definition earlier. I assume some of you weren't in the room, but you've got a legal definition of open source and it's where the source code is publicly available. You can inspect it, you can modify it and where it's distributed on an open source license, which for me is an OSI approved license that meets the open source definition. And that definition talks about a borderless society. That definition talks about the ability to have everybody in the world, everybody in the planet use it, irrespective of where they're from or who they are. It talks about it being used for every use case, whether the use case is uh, giving it to Russians when there's a war going on in Ukraine, whether the use case is commercial or non-commercial. And that's something that we have to hold very dear if we want open source to survive that ability for it to be something global. Now, I talked this morning about a shift, and I, I'm going to slightly repeat myself, but I, I think I have to because there will be people who watch this and don't see the whole thing the whole day. And I think we've seen a really big change in the last five to 10 years because what we've seen is an adoption of open source at pace and scale, and that's happened for a number of different reasons, but the digitalization of all of our lives has been part of it. Now, I've lost my phone. If anybody finds it, I would... Oh, no, I've got it. I do lose it quite a lot. Um, this, 2008, was the first iPhone. I think 2008, later in the year, we got the first Android operating system. So you're looking at, what, 15 years? I don't know if you remember the first version of apps. They were terrible. Nobody used them. Now, if I want to do my laundry, I go into an app. If I want to move money, I go onto an app. If I want to listen to a book, I go onto an app. My whole life is dictated by that phone, which is why I worry when I lose it. And I also look for it when I'm talking to somebody on it because it, it being a, a means of speaking to people isn't really what it's about for me. It's about using those apps. And some of those apps are open source, but actually what sits behind it, the infrastructure, is much, much more important. And that infrastructure that we've touched on this morning, our national infrastructure, our national critical infrastructure, our enterprise infrastructure, that all serves this, which serves my life. And without all of that, my life wouldn't be as convenient, as easy, in some cases as uh, you know, fundamental as my, my friend Karen um, Sandler has a, a pacemaker, which connects up to an app. You know, in some pe people's cases, it's life-defining. So. The digital economy has changed our lives and it's elevated the engineer's role. Git, a bit older than 10 years, but what we see is Git allowing the collective, collaborative, public repositories like GitHub to really come into their own. Now, my friend Steve Wally just wandered into the room and he's never heard me do this before, to my knowledge. So, Stephen, um, oh, there he's behind the pillar. So, you can see how he's aged or not if you want to have a look. He's just peeking out from behind the pillar. <laughs> Why should I be the only one? Um, so this is Steve giving a keynote in 2018 at the Linux Foundation Open Source Summit in Edinburgh. And he explains the journey that Microsoft has been on. And he talks about that journey, and he says that Microsoft has shifted from a stage where you know, every joke I knew about open source, the punchline was Microsoft. Steve Ballmer described open source as a cancer. 
to a stage where Satya Nadala is asking for us to look at today and the future. And Steve explains that journey on the basis of three things. First of all, anybody who's learned to code in the last 10, 15 years, they all work in a, an open source way. They use open source methodologies and they're used to using open source code. Secondly, customers today actually ask for open source because today much of the innovation that you really want to use is only available open source. And thirdly, cloud. And I didn't really mention this this morning, but the shift that we have seen to an infrastructure-based enterprise economy and you know, personal economy, frankly, has had a huge amount to do with the success of open source software. And I think Steve's, I think it's 13 minutes long, it's much quicker than I speak, but I think Steve's... Um, presentation is really worth listening to. Very quickly, I'll touch on a couple of other threats to open source. Um, we've seen organizations that haven't really thought their business model through in advance or have had challenges with their business models where they distribute open source software. We've seen pushback, and we've seen pushback uh, against the cloud companies. So this is a piece that was actually in the New York Times. It's not specifically about open source, but the content pretty much is. And they talk about um, strip mining. And strip mining, for my UK friends, is a US term. It comes from New York State, and it talks about stripping too much coal off the land and not leaving enough resources. And it's effectively what was being alleged by the uh, founders of a number of open source companies. But the thing is, they weren't doing anything wrong. So we saw Shea Bannon, the uh, founder of Elastic, writing about doubling down on open. And if you read that, you would think they were becoming more open source, but actually they moved away from an OSI approved license and they moved on to a, a license which uh, allowed them to restrict commercialization. And even last year, we saw it again with Lightbound. We also see challenges and threats, and I think Ian Mitchell QC is going to talk to you about this on the standard side, but we see challenges and threats coming from the telco sector, where I think something like seven organizations hold 70% of the standards that are standard essential mm -hmm. patents. But those standard essential patents challenge our ability to distribute open source software. And if you have to have a patent travel with it, and it's royalty bearing, even if it's frammed, you have a problem. And there's a problem with certain licenses, but there's also a whole sort of ecosystem problem. It just doesn't fit with what we do. And this is something that's going to need a lot more pushback, or we're going to see uh, a redefinition of open source by the telco sectors. And they're actively out there doing that. They're actively out there promoting other licenses and spreading FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. I've mentioned Ukraine. I've mentioned the issues that we've seen there with protestware. So... Again, this morning, I talked about the value that open source generates. I've talked about our reporting. I've talked about how our legislature is looking at it and how COVID is impacting us. I've talked about security and the fact that we need to consider making sure that when we use open source software, as users, we implement it. We use good technical hygiene, good governance, or good curation, that we do that in a way that allows the software to be well-maintained, well-selected, safe, secure, whatever we need it to be. But we recognize that that burden does not sit with the open source community who are distributing the software. Another person who's in the room, I don't get to do this very often and actually say all these celebrities are in the room I'm talking in. So Eric Brewer wrote a piece for our State of Open report last year on curation, which I would recommend to you. It's not particularly long, it explains it beautifully, probably much better than I can. Um, this I don't like so much. This was written by a staff member at Atlantic Council, and I think it was unwise. I certainly think the headline was attention-grabbing for all the wrong reasons. But we see more and more focus from our legislator because we now have infrastructure and critical national infrastructure, which is built on open source software. And suddenly everybody's aware. Suddenly everybody knows that we need to do something about this and ensure that that software is going to be secure so that the services delivered to our citizens are safe and secure. We talked about this this morning. My personal belief and something that I've written about for a long time is uh, that open source needs to be not recategorized, but given an additional respect and an additional category. So as well as being in the commons, it needs to be a digital public good. And we need to see that uh, funded by international governments in a joined up way. So I'm hoping I've got us almost back in time. I'm taking Jen's slot and we can go into the panel, which I'm also moderating. I did say I didn't want to do all the speaking, but there we go.
So I hope some of that's been useful to you. Um, it's obviously recorded and I have gone very fast because I wanted to get through it in the time that I was allocated. Please download the book. It does me no good if you do, but it's a useful tool to you to be able to just go and research things. I only wrote one chapter. There are many people much cleverer than me who wrote much more and some really useful stuff. I see McCoy Smith in the room who worked on copyright and patents. Steve Wally wrote about community. So I think that it's a useful tool that you should take advantage of. And if you do want a physical copy, I think I'm doing it. I'm just giving them away at 12 o'clock tomorrow. <laughs> I think it's 12. It'll be on the, the shed. Anyway, um, very quickly, does anybody have any questions before I move to the panel? No, yeah, I wouldn't either. I've probably done fine to do the pace I've got it. Sorry. Um, so if it's all right with you, I'm going to go straight into a panel with Sarah Novotny from Microsoft and Eric Brewer, who joined me this morning. And I suspect you're all here to ask them questions, not me, which is why you don't have any for me. But um, if it's okay with the... Do we need to change slides or anything from a tech perspective? I'm sure you do. But can I invite Eric Brewer and Sarah Novotny onto the stage? Do you know whether, yeah, I was getting feedback, this has been on all whole time. So it's been quite a busy few days for me, as you probably can guess. Um, I haven't done the right thing, and I've not spent a lot of time with Eric or Sarah discussing all of this in advance. <laughs> which means, including Eric speaking on the stage today, he had vague clue what I was going to talk about. <laughs> but um, I think that they are much more experienced and much more relevant in every way than I am in this space because they're engineers and they work at the coalface and they lead teams working at the coalface. So if it's all right, sir, I'm going to start with Eric and this term curation. Please do. Tell it's us again about curation. It'll help me get it yeah. nicely defined Buy as well. Okay. Time. Yeah. <laughs> that too. Huh. So I think the short version of curation is it's the thing we need to fill the gap between the as-is open source that we produce in great quantities and make the world more innovative and, and more productive, and the top-down expectations set by a variety of players, it's mostly governments, reasonably on behalf of their citizens saying, we have expectations about security or safety and these are not negotiable. And you can't fill non-negotiable uh, invariants with open source as is software <laughs> by itself, right? Those are in some sense incompatible without something in the middle. I call that thing in the middle curation, but the, the purpose of curation is to, to be uh, an entity that is being accountable for those invariants and saying, yes, this software is going to meet your security requirements. And even though I'm getting as in inputs from open source and, and leverage them, uh, I, the curator, will do whatever is necessary to make sure that patches are applied, dependencies are checked, tests are run, the kinds of things that you would do if you were you know, doing high quality direct software yourself. right? So we want to leverage the open source. We don't want to say, oh, it's just got to be better or just go, the maintainer should just fix it. That's not the model. The model is that you come to you as is. If you want expectations that are stronger than that on top, you need to bridge that gap. And curation is my mental model of how to do that. Exactly what that means yet is still being defined. I'm not saying there'll be a curator. I think there'll be many curators. I think there'll be curators of curators, uh, specialists for different sectors, specialists for different countries. I've talked to three countries now that would like to have their own curation for the stuff for their governments on top of whatever other curation occurs uh, in, in these spaces because they have, you know, that's how you really make sure that your particular government's invariants are met. So that's the, the role of curation. And I believe it is important to the long-term health of open source. And I think it's something that can be complementary to the roles that maintainers currently play, the creators of open source software, where they can focus on the parts that they actually want to do, and yet, collectively, we can still meet these higher order goals like security <coughs> and safety. So I'll, I'll stop there, but that's the quick intro to what curation is and why we need it. 
Thanks, Eric. So, Sarah, do you have your own word for this, or do you want to work on Eric's definition of curation? Curation is a, a fine word here. I think the, the interesting piece about curated software is one of the points that was made this morning by the audience, which is it, it risks moving the, the locus of responsibility from the person who is running the software to somewhere else in the value chain. And, and to your point, that, um, that has always been big companies with contracts to get support for things, you know, and we, we see this across the industry now. I think it's a yes and. I think we need those support contracts and we need to continue to talk about open source as a cost <coughs> of goods and needing investment yep. if you are using it. And if you are developing software, you are using open source. So I think there's a yes and yeah, there. Yeah, and I think that's the interesting bit where Eric and I had a, a nuanced debate when we initially talked about this because my model is very much this public-private enterprise, mm -hmm. public-private partnership, where I believe that what the state will have to do, because they will have no choice, they will have to manage this. And it, it, it's not something they will have learned, I think, from proprietary software. I mean, they, they must have. Yeah. So I suspect that they won't just go back to that lock-in type model and there will have to be an infrastructure created, but creating that infrastructure is a huge piece of work, right? Well, there's an enormous piece of it that is quite literally just pulling back our skills because mm -hmm. we did all of that outsourcing for many years. So we have to be investing in those skills in, within our companies. And that's, that's a risk, I think, still. And I guess that's one of the beauties of open source where that skills development, and this is not a magic wand, you're not just gonna suddenly start right. participating in an open source community and have the skills that you need, but there is the potential to learn the skills by becoming part of a community, by becoming a contributor. And um, people are much kinder than I, I think we all expect when you make your first contribution. And there's a lot of support for people coming into communities. There are a lot of programs and projects, uh, things like Google Summer of Code, that will help you learn and get you engaged with communities. And I, I suspect that a lot of the learning is done that way. Eric. I do think it's an and in the sense that curation does not by itself lead to a healthy open source no. ecosystem or a high rate of innovation. Mm -hmm. But conversely, funding open source, even if you gave it a $10 billion grant to fix all open source, that doesn't give you accountability either. Right? That just makes it healthier and more vibrant and faster innovation. So those two are both great, but they're complementary. Right? Curation is really about the accountability we need to use it in the places we're already using it. Yes. Right? We are assuming it's trustworthy and people are doing their best, but honestly, it's, it's not there yet. That's so it's true for software in general, but I think the, the curation is really about the accountability on top of as is software, but I'm 100% in favor of broad support for open source because it is an innovation engine and it actually is also a, a collaboration engine, yeah. as you mentioned. Yeah, and I think that that's an interesting point. I was about to jump in when you were talking about open source there. And it's true of all software, right? Mm -hmm. So in a digital economy, security is not an open source issue. We have our own nuances and we wash our dirty linen in public when things go wrong. But security, security is uh, an issue for all software and everything that's digital. And as a lawyer who spent 25 years negotiating contracts, many of which were proprietary, the reality is that your contract is only as good as the indemnity wording that you've got, yep. the cap on liability, the exclusions to that liability, yep. the insurance if you were smart enough to ask for it that sits behind it, and then you've got to go and look at what the exclusions in that are. You might not be named on it, you might be named on it, but there's all sorts of depth you have to go into. But in a proprietary environment, I would question whether you're actually getting very much more in most instances than you're getting from the open source. What you are getting, so it's not necessarily the liability piece, is you're getting someone you can pick up the phone to on a support contract. Yeah. You're getting accountability. Yeah. yeah, to a level, to a level. I, I think there's a to a level in that. You get support, you get someone to help you. I think the majority of the problem that we've seen though <laughs> with Log4j specifically was not even about delivering good accountable packages, but the actual application, the um, successful integration into people's existing infrastructure mm -hmm. when we've had you know turnover and nobody's touched that piece of code in 20 years or 10 years and we've had nobody knows about that and we don't have good ways to introspect across 
all of our code bases. Google yeah. has a very specific, very wonderful we monorepo. We do in <coughs> most places, but even yep. Google has places where we had to you know, go find Log4j by hand yep. and pull it out, right? Yep. It's not, not perfect by any means. Mm -hmm. But I think you're, that's a good example sense of it was affected a huge number of things. Yep. Most people, one, did, had no idea they used Log4j. Mm -hmm. No one, myself included, included, would have put it on a list of critical software that needs nope. to be protected, but nope. clearly in retrospect it should have been, yep. right? But so we have, we have tens of thousands of those things where we don't know yet that they're critical. Right? And, but, but worst of all, to Sarah's point, we have, you could fix it, like I said this morning, in a day, roughly, yep. if you had a good process to actually find it, rebuild it, and deploy it, and most companies don't. Yep. And I would say, no governments do, I can't name one, <laughs> that can actually turn around software and, and make an update. You know, they have a social security site, so to speak, or some mm -hmm. other public information at risk. You actually need to be able to push, push security changes quickly. And, and in general, that's not possible today. I'm sorry about that. It's, it is technically feasible to do it. It is not implemented in practice. And, you, and you that is a, that's a whole, for, has nothing to do with open source, that has to do with software, software. Yeah. delivery in general. Yeah. Yep. And, and uh, maturity of our industry, because we still sort of YOLO our way into deployments, you know, 12 times a day, which is not bad. I'm not saying that it's better when you wait six months and drop all of it in at once. I'm, I'm suggesting that there's, um, there's less accountability sometimes. It is also highly varied across sectors. There are Fe sectors that are yep. much more likely to do fast updates yep. and sectors that are famously slow, mm. maybe healthcare, for example, yep. where there's, you know, Safety critical anything. machines running Windows 98, right? <laughs> no offense to Microsoft, but even they would say Windows 98 is well, not running. It, it, <laughs> it was also one of the challenges we would face in Canonical because, uh, you know, to, to be the lawyer that writes the contract, you have to understand the product and you have to understand the risk. Mm -hmm. And if you don't understand those, your contracts are terrible. So we would go to particular kinds of enterprises, particular sectors, and we would explain, well, you know, in this contract negotiation, we're not gonna take the risk on this particular thing because we'll push out bug fixes, we'll push out updates, you'll get one every day. And they would go, ah! You know, we're not gonna implement a, a release every day. We're not gonna deal with bug fixes every day. We'll do that every six months. And then you have this huge gap if you do a gap analysis between the reality and what's possible to do, and then you get back into that proprietary mindset where we'll only take critical releases, and that's just not how open source works. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of these software issues that we're talking about have shifted a bit, and I think the engineering practices have shifted a bit. So we're already working towards curation, or whatever you call it, and building good practice, right? Yep. Uh, even within open source projects, because we see more and more open source projects have um, deployment pipelines, build pipelines, so that test coverage, so that you can know that what pops out at the end has these um, constraints on it or these guarantees of some sort, which of course still mm -hmm. offer us no liability, but we know that these tests have passed. Um, so in much larger, much more mature projects, you're almost at a curated state without someone who managed the support of it. Yes. Um, yep. I think there's, it's worth stepping back though about this velocity issue. Because I think this is, a, this is a software develop issue, not an open source issue. Thank you, yeah. yes, um, absolutely. I can't say that enough. But <laughs> yeah. I would say, I want to tie it back to the sectors a little bit because you know, why is that device running Windows 98 inside? And you know, versus being updated to something new. And I think it's because there's a whole part of society in sectors that believe that the, the key to security is no change, mm -hmm. right? If I lock it down and certify it, and now it's okay, then I'm done. And that's not true for software. In fact, it's the opposite, right? So if you want actual security and you're using software, and it's a network connected device in particular, you have to be able to do updates, mm -hmm. right? The biggest advantage something like Android or Chrome has is it's doing updates in the background for you all the time, right? Microsoft Windows is the same yep, thing, same. to be fair to Microsoft. So that's part of having a good security posture. If your regulations say a device has to be recertified if you change the software, then that device software is never gonna change. Yep. And that's exactly what's happening. Right? And healthcare is not the only industry to do that, but you want regulations to say the opposite. We expect you, if you're a network device, to be able to do over-the-air updates 
and make sure you're getting mm -hmm. software updates and firmware changes because the security posture is going to change uh, every month. Right? That's a big shift we have to make as a, as a population. To, to sort of step it back from there even, you have two different um, speeds. You have the speed of the industry moving and the, the cracks moving or the hacks moving and the, the um, uh, risks in uh, security um, vulnerabilities moving and you have software moving. And so the two together really, the software that you're developing is moving. And the two together are what start making, to your point, those mm -hmm. gaps because this may have been patched but we haven't deployed it. But how is it, yeah. So it ends up being this, this lovely complexity. Oh, and we have, I think I have to see a question. Yeah, and it's a mindset shift, right? So I remember saying to people in Canonical that I felt like I was unlearning everything I'd ever been taught because I was taught to be uh, you know, a lawyer who protected the interests of the company and to manage that risk and those interests and to close things down and take the path of least resistance so that things wouldn't go wrong. But actually, if you want to innovate, you have to do the opposite. And getting all of us to be free, and I, I mean, I, I'll be honest, I revert to type at times. You know, if the, the, the shit hits the proverbial, then I will be absolutely draconian about we just have to do this. But the reality is if you want to be creative, you want to be innovative and you want to see change, you can't be like that and you have to open up. And I actually think there's a whole generational thing going on where we're seeing that happening more and more across a whole culture, but also in software engineering. So if you're okay with it, I'm gonna suggest that we take questions and I know Charlie's Sounds already great. got his Ooh. hand up. Sure. Charlie's yeah. first, I think, and then the gentleman at the back, maybe oh. here. Do we have a mic? Yeah. We should have two roaming mics in the room. I spec those as well. <laughs> no? Yeah, you can shout. We can repeat, we can repeat, repeat it. Yeah. Roaming mics. We can totally repeat. There we go. That's what we're after. <laughs> it is our first session, so I did say there would need to be a level of forgiveness across the next day or two as we work things out. Hi. Let me forgive us. <laughs> so uh, I love the idea of curation, uh, but. In, in practical terms, a lot of the work on key uh, open source infrastructure happens by, by individuals or SMEs with a particular specialism. Mm -hmm. um, what I'm going to ask is how can the big tech companies, um, some represented in the room and some of the others, yep. uh, help these, these smaller organizations contribute? Uh, because to be honest, you know, we need some of those large amounts of money that the big tech companies have uh, to flow downstream to some of the smaller fry. But actually, working with big tech companies for small enterprises is very, very hard. It can take months and months and months of very difficult contracts and, and lots and lots of money spent on legal advice to even get to a position where you can contribute to an open source project. So is there a way we can make this easier? Some kind of templates, some kind of procurement easement, whatever we can do, so the big companies can support the smaller companies who have that expertise. I think there are two ways that this is happening already Don't today. Do that in the UK. Oh, sorry. Um, apparently, there are which way? Okay, that way. Two okay. ways, <laughs> or two ways, or that way. Okay, good. Two ways. <laughs> Pardon me. Um, there are two ways. I think this is already happening. One, um, Google and Microsoft together founded the Open Source Security Foundation inside the Linux Foundation. And in that, we have a number of projects. Um, to Eric's point earlier today, we're trying a lot of stuff. We're not sure what's going to stick completely. There's memory safety work. There's um, direct intervention with money to projects through a, a co um, a co branded thing that we do called Alpha Omega. Mm -hmm. And there are a number of other different projects looking at, say, signing security to make attribution. Um, more uh, more useful and more capable and, and easier for so it will hit more uh, of our products or not product projects. Um, so I think the second way that this is already happening is through these things like some amount of curation. Um, Google has assured OS. Um, Microsoft has packages that we deliver for our um, company-led projects. And we also see that there are, in, there's in fact a VC, VC-backed firm that does this as well. Tidelift does this very well. It's an interesting model because they make the relationships with the upstream software and you do buy functionally uh, upstream maintainer insurance. So if you have a problem and you are a, a, uh, if you are a customer of Tidelift, then they can help get that security uh, vulnerability or issue fixed. 
They're pretty interesting. I mean, the, the founders of Tidelift, uh, Louis Villa, who many of you will know, lawyer, a lawyer, a coder, uh, they are all ex-Red Hat, so it's unsurprising in the way that they've modeled it. It's very much along the sort of subscription yeah. model that you see from Red Hat. Eric, did you want to jump in on that? I think there's a few things to add. I think <laughs> the general approach here, you're right, Google can't actually meaningfully individually interact with all the individual maintainers. Right? We picked a few, like I mentioned, OpenSL. There's a few others in that category uh, when they're really critical. Um, so the path for Google, at least, is to, to work indirectly via mostly foundations. And so we've committed to $100 million spent over the next, I think it's five years, um, maybe it's 10, some number of years, uh, to basically g give that money through foundations to work on these problems. These are parts, OpenSSF is one of them. That's the biggest one so far, CNCF, which does a lot of work yep. in Kubernetes space and all its dependencies. But you know, we ended up founding things like PyPy for Python stuff. Uh, you know, there's, there's lots of, you know, Microsoft doing a similar thing with NPM because mm -hmm. that's now part of GitHub. Yep. So I think this indirect model where there's an intermediary that's typically a foundation that can have us, frankly, a, a, a more direct, simpler relationship. And by the way, it can work in many different countries, can deal with many different constraints that are, are hard for a big company, frankly. Mm -hmm. So I, I, it's one of many things we're trying, but I also feel like there's, there are models coming where there are you know, ways for maintainers to, to do curation in addition to doing maintaining. And we've seen people do offer private contracts to fix certain bugs. Yep. Um, I'm talking with some developers about that model. And again, it's just more of an experiment. It's, we're trying to figure out how that works. Also, I'm trying to take an a la carte approach. Like if, if you're a maintainer, here's the things that I think we can do for you, but which ones are actually useful to you? Like oftentimes money's not even the yeah. biggest issue. Maybe it's you want credits for running test cases because you're using your own money to pay for all the testing. Or maybe you want someone to do some help on the security review. Or maybe you would just like a way to run uh, pre-submit tests, what we call them, so that if someone makes a change, you can actually decide if that change is safe to accept without having to do a bunch of manual review yourself. So I think there's a lot of ways we could help maintainers, but it's, I think, an open question about, I'll put it this way, I've heard a wide variety of responses from maintainers what kind of help they actually want. So that's why it's gonna have to be some kind of a la carte approach. I think there's also a way where we can sort of help ourselves, Charlie, and I don't know how well we've got this under control yet. One of the, the things that Open UK did, and we're quite a different uh, organization, we don't follow the, the way that traditional industry organizations work. We're not a membership organization. We're not made up of uh, enterprises. We're made up of people. And we're made up of people who work in or want to work in open technology, which means that anybody, whether you're working for a UK company or not, um, can join us. And what generally happens is that these organizations are focused on uh, homegrown companies because it's local companies they focus on and therefore if you're working for a Google or a Microsoft you can't really participate so we're open to everybody that's interested in this space but one of the things as a not-for-profit that we're able to do is join some of these organizations so we're a member of OpenSSF and we're a member of a number of different projects and to my shame we haven't done enough with it yet but that kind of thing is where people who are in smaller companies who maybe can't afford to join these projects or contribute or get to be part of it can use us as a conduit to represent us on those projects. And I suspect it's something, I know there's a, a number of people in other countries who want to replicate our model from Open UK because it's quite different and quite specific where we're helping them. And I suspect we'll see more sort of intermediary organizations like ours helping individuals access some of the resources that the big companies have because as an individual it can be hard to do but as a collective, we have a lot more power and a lot more access to things. Yep. So I think there'll be more of that over time. So question at the back there. Oh, we asked this question and there are two, There are two of them. Hi. Um, just wondering, uh, just wanted to see your thoughts on whether we would have some open source software, um, maybe a chat GBT further um, upstream to do some of these um, curations, um, so open source curation, and then uh, further downstream, then you'd have people doing the curation. What were your thoughts on that? Oh, it's a great question. That's the one I'm thinking about quite a bit, which is, and I'll broaden the question a little bit, which is, 
uh, a lot of the work, this background, a lot of the work in maintaining open source is pretty mundane. Right? It's not fun to do, and that's why it doesn't get done. Right? It's just the, the writing new features or getting something to work is a fantastic experience. Most developers love that part of it. I love it. Right? But then you know, patching some dependency that you didn't write and is broken because you need it to work for your case, not fun. Right. So the question really is, what is the general role for ML to automate these tasks that are mundane? And I think there's a huge role for that. We see a little bit now with kind of pair programming or code completion, mm -hmm. but that's frankly pretty primitive. Google has some internal tools that are pretty good, but they're not quite ready for prime time, but I think you can, you can see that they're coming. Um, but ignoring that, I think there's, the, there's a very broad case here to be made for Oh, if you made this change to this package, the almost same code is over here in this package. It's probably broken too. So A, find it for me, because I don't want to have to figure that out as a separate CVE later. And, and B, why don't you just suggest a fix? Maybe I have to review the patch and apply it, but that's a, still a lot less work than tracking it down, finding all the versions, picking which versions are broken. All right, we can save a ton of uninteresting human work with this process, but it's, I would say, Stay tuned, there's a lot that's going to happen from yep. all the players in this space in the next year because it is so exciting and it is needed. There's one at the back there, well, there's two at the back, and this lady here. Hi, no. I um, thought, I, sorry, uh, have we got 20 minutes still? Yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I hope you two aren't tired, that's quite a lot of work. <laughs> what, what do you see as cultural barriers to curation, and how do you overcome the cultural barrier of longevity? So. Something that was developed two or three years ago that's forgotten, as you've said, it's in the backlog. It's done, it's in production, but needs a patch. How do you, how do you overcome those? Well, I'll give you a little answer first, which is the first point is just to point out that open source is w w way more inclusive and open and uh, amenable to contributions across the board. So that already helps. And in fact, you know, open source was doing remote work well before COVID. So yep. it's actually already naturally collaborative online. You can be in a wide variety of locations and time zones and be very productive. And that's a great freedom for many people that really matters. Um, but I think your question sounds like it's more about, um, you know, the kind of long tail of projects that have lost interest. Mm -hmm. And some of those people, the maintainers have said, I'm not interested in this project anymore. Like it was a famous story where the person gave it up because they weren't interested to a new maintainer, that maintainer, who in retrospect was anonymous, then corrupted it and used it as an attack vehicle. Yeah. Right? And you know, the four original maintainer didn't mean for that to happen, but it happened. Right? So I think the important part for OpenSF that we're looking at is what are the packages that actually need to make sure they have an active maintainer on? Because about 30% of packages don't have a maintainer at all if you just look at like act activity. Right. And there might be someone that thinks they're responsible, but it, you can't tell from the outside. And certainly you wouldn't know who to contact if there was a problem. Right. So those are risky things to use. And maybe we shouldn't be using them, or maybe we should get someone to, to take responsibility. That's an option too. But we're still learning, I think, what is that, that long tail and how to deal with it. I would love to see, at least for the you know, top 1,000 or 10,000 things, you know, someone that views themselves as responsible. And that's, they don't need to be perfect, and they don't have to have like all the things. But, but for Lock4J, we had at least two people who say, oh, these people at least know the code. And we can't put it all on them, but they're a great place to start. Right? And we can see what help they need. Right? That's the approach you want to take. How can we help you in this crisis? But in general, by the way, we're not very good at helping each other in, in these crises yeah. either. Yeah. So that's a whole other area that I think that OpenSSF would like to look into long term, the kind of the firefighting crisis yeah. management aspect. Yeah, I was going to mention. Go ahead. Fantastic. No, the, one of the things that we have not yet manifested in the open SSF, but <clears throat> both Microsoft and Google have been talking about, is this firefighting force where we get multiple large companies who have skills to work together when someone goes, ah, oh, critical CVE and something that's going to hit, you know, 200 million uh, deployments. You know, like we need to pay attention to this today. Um, but there's also still this, this challenge, especially with things that are long tail still used and maybe, not, um, and maybe not maintained as well. How much of that is because you absolutely need that long tail thing, or how much of that is because you are not in the good habit of you know, updating your dependencies and moving forward? <clears throat> 
So there's another aspect of work that Microsoft is doing, which is in um, <clears throat> the IEEE, and we're working on open source standards, like what are best practices for my development community, which also include you know, supportable timelines. Um, a two, uh, I'm giving examples, these, I, they will end up or not in, yeah. in the work, but you know, two maintainer, two reviewers on every patch or every upstream, you know, like these are, 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 are things that we're going to be discussed in the open to find out what the best practices are to implement it, to then try to have this, this list that projects can look to because a lot of the small projects, a lot of the really small ones that, that feel riskier, I think, to large companies, are accidentally famous. You know, it's the, I had a left pad. Um, you know, I made a thing to fix my niche and somebody else take, starts using it, you know, over and over and over and over. And then I am getting mail, I'm getting GitHub issues going, why aren't you fixing this? Why didn't you do this? And I have no obligation as that maintainer. But we still need to figure out how to work with that in our, um, in our own open source consumption. So I think, there's, I think this is going to forever be a question of the consumer and the provider or the consumer and the curator in this space as we evolve from this adolescent industry into a more, um, into a more mature industry that knows you know, the risks and rewards of the work we're doing um, at more of a visceral level. There's a lot around that, and I think one of the interesting pieces is to sit on a stage with Google and Microsoft, <laughs> two very large companies. Um, I'm sure your friends, I'm sure your frenemies, I'm sure you've got all sorts of different relationships which all the lawyers in the room will be used to mm -hmm. dealing with within organizations. Yeah. It's life, it's, it's how tech works. Yeah. And one of the- used to work with them. Right. That's true. Mm -hmm. There you go. <laughs> so, yeah. No. <laughs> but what you see is this ability for, um, I can't remember what you called the fire response, the fact that you could have that response yep. unit set up because it's innovative, it's collaborative, and it's open source. If it wasn't open source, you would not be collaborating in this way and sharing the outputs when something goes wrong. And it, whilst we do wash our dirty linen in public, there is that collective response and the many eyes being on a problem that allows the open source communities to respond in a different way and allows that response to be very honest and very open. And uh, I mentioned Steve Wally before, a totally different point. Well, Steve is running this IEEE project. I am very bad that I've not engaged very much because of this conference, but there's a lot of work going on in that. And I think it's something that I would commend to you and we'll make sure we push it out in our, our newsletters at Open UK for the next few weeks so that those of you who want to get more engaged and understand the de facto standards that we're building as an industry for ourselves, get uh, more awareness and engagement and access to that. Um, I'm not gonna get you up on stage, Steve, but you're mm -hmm. probably talking about yeah. it tomorrow anyway, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, we have another question at the back, Christian. Yeah, hi, so it, He's back. I, I, I was the, the guilty, I was the guilty person from this morning that raised the, uh, the comment about shifting responsibility. So I, I still kind of think, and this is a really interesting discussion, I still kind of think that the, the term curation or the discussion that's happening here, you, it's kind of, there's a lot of subjects coming into it. Yeah. Um, and I think in some ways that takes away from some of the narratives that we're trying to pursue as a industry. One of these is, I think, the, the question of uh, software security, uh, whether it's open source software or closed source, source software, I think that's the same question. You know, you, you have to secure your pipeline, there's a, a risk process involved, um, and there may be, and, and then I think there's a separate question, and this is what I've kind of wanted to get down to, of how can you finance or contribute into that pipeline, which I think is a real question. And I, I've followed the work of Tidelift, for example. Yeah. I know there are, I think GitHub has a GitHub sponsors yeah, or yeah. some equivalent There's loads type of program. These projects. Yeah. Um, and I know when I worked previously in a large enterprise, we started to put in place uh, service contracts with companies that would help us with software and as a condition of the service contract, what we said was, you have to push your change that we have requested back to the community, and it's only when the community has accepted or at least you know, uh, 
or, or rejected, but for a, a, a reason that we understand, um, will we kind of acknowledge that the work has been done and issue payment and all of this kind of stuff? Mm -hmm. So I think, I think rather than talking about we need to change frameworks and all of this, I think the subject of security is valid. The subject of finance within open source communities is valid. Mm -hmm. But I think it, it's also a question of educating uh, the, 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 the companies that are using open source mm -hmm. around how they can uh, come back into that yeah. process. Yeah, I think there's a massive piece of work to be done on the education side, and that's why we're hosting this conference, to be quite frank, is to get people at the table discussing these things to make it uh, something that is more engaged for all of us. Um, we have, I think, 65 hours of content being produced from this content uh, from this conference that will all be freely available to download. And more and more of that needs to be done by more and more people. And we need to engage more with those who are just getting into open source or who've been using it and not even known they were using it. Yeah. But the, the thing that I would pick up on particularly is this open source versus proprietary. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I'm an open source advocate, I would say, these days. So I... I that's a fair title, right, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah, okay, I'll take that now. So I think the thing is that whether you are being open source or whether you're being proprietary, you're going to face the same issues. The nuance of the issue is different. And you're facing issues of digitalization and you're facing issues of software, right? So the actual implementation, the actual instance of the issue might be different, but you've got the same fundamental issues. And I would actually challenge that we should be pushing the proprietary companies to also step up to the same game because we have the same risk as consumers from enterprises and from the public sector of the black boxes they hold their code in going wrong. Hang on, Christian, you, you've had two shots and we've got other people down here, so I, I think that we, we should uh, move on. But do you want to contribute something before we do? Um, I was going to suggest that proprietary and open source software really aren't any different anymore, and we need to be mm. really careful about this. Well, hold on, because proprietary software includes open, open source. source. Yeah, that's End of story. At this point, 96% yeah. of software has open source components in it. When is the last time you wrote a math library? So I didn't read out live every line because it was quite yeah. a lot from the DCMS. I read most of it, but there is a line in that DCMS wording that acknowledges that most proprietary software today will incorporate has components. open source. Yes. Yeah. And I think that's a huge shift yep. for, a, for a government department to actually get that is a huge shift. Yep. Eric, did you? I'll just add, because maybe get some light on curation in general, which is um, even Google, which consumes a, a huge amount of open source, produces a huge amount of open source, it would be Google's best interest to use curators for some things. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is if it's an area that you aren't going to actually put in the time to understand all the dependencies in a language you may not know, yep. right, you should not be doing that work directly. Not to mention the fact it's probably not cost effective if you're using it as, a, as something that's not your core competency, yeah. right? So you need to do that indirectly no matter what, right? And that's really the question is how do we enable uh, this indirect model where you can get software with support for a wide variety of open source packages in a wide variety of languages for a wide variety of use cases. Right? That's where we have to go. And even Google will be curating, need to curate things, even though we're producing other things that are curated for others. They're complementary. Yeah, and I think there's, there's I, I, we need to move on to another question, but just before we do, I think there is a, a piece around copyleft. Mm. And someone like Frank Karlaschek, <laughs> who's down in the entrepreneur's room, would tell you that copyleft is a, a fantastic business model. And they would tell you that because it forces that contribution back. You can't redistribute without it. So it already exists as a concept. You know, we don't have to reinvent the concept. It's just how you want to manage your software and release it. Now, this lady's been waiting very patiently down here at the front. Very patient. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, so I come from the data governance space and management, data management space. And it seems to me that it's, there's so much we've learned in data governance that is directly applicable here, such as managing the metadata around the curation. <coughs> Um, yep. and cataloging it and being able to analyze it and then being able to also, so historically one of the, the places that data governance started of course was with regulation around personal data. Mm -hmm. um, so to question to you, if you were to say to governments there's something big enough for you to be interested in regulating here, mm -hmm. just like with data it was personal data, personal information. 
would it, what, what would it be? What would the one little nugget be to just get a toe in the door mm -hmm. to making people think this is worth government level, maybe a lot other is worth IEEE level or standards level, um, and it probably should go the same way of data governance and be very broken down and everybody be governing things in small batches. But um, what's that one? Yeah, boy, that's a tough one. Yeah, I have a very one? esoteric answer, unfortunately, which I'll try to do quickly, which is that um, in general, there's two kinds of regulation governments do that are very different in nature. The one we talk about normally is kind of top-down mm -hmm. invariance. You must meet these properties. You can meet them however you like. If you meet them, you're good. Mm -hmm. right? That's, you know, lots of things fit that model. There's another model, though, that we don't think about as much, which is what we do in cryptography, which is, no, you don't get to meet a set of requirements. You actually have to use this implementation of this algorithm because we spent a lot of time making sure it works, mm -hmm. right? And no other implementation is even allowed. So it's very prescriptive about how you solve it. And I think there's a, a, some reason to explore for the, the very low levels of software, things like how do you find a domain name where it, we could be prescriptive and say, this is the stack to find domain names. It's open source, so it's not about competitive advantage, yep. right? And we're mostly using the same code anyway today, so it's not a big change. But we could say for that stuff, it's so important, it's so fundamental, there's only one allowed way to do it. And it will change over time, because the software changes, but that whole, we'll, we're prescribing the stack to use versus the invariance to meet. Now that has not been tried, so that's yeah. a very speculative statement. <laughs> But it, will, it would get us to a place where we have both velocity for those things and can make critical changes, and we actually can put in the effort to make sure it's right, which is hard to do if you just do a top-down thing and everybody's on their own as to how to meet that goal. That's, a, that's good for high-level invariance, but I think there's a place to start at the bottom where we could say, let's grow something that's a really good foundation. I think I, so, Eric often goes to the technical, although you went to polit political this time, or, or policy. This was mixed. Uh, yeah. This was a mix, yeah. Um, I often go to people, process, and community, and so I think what I would, um, would love to see um, as a tiny little tweak in, in regulation is even just language shift where we get away from commercial open source, or Absolutely. commercial open source software, which doesn't, or, yeah, anyway, there's, in, in, gov in government regulation, there's also this concept of commercial open source software, which doesn't have anything to do with commercials, but yeah, anyway, it's complicated, and it, getting rid of that would be awesome. Um, I think the other piece would be um, some sort of um, regulation or definition for a set of critical, maybe their projects, maybe their process, or maybe their, um, uh, protocols, but some critical set of um, tech that then we are asked as um, as our uh, big companies to consider as cost of our goods. So that we then, as we consider it a cost of goods, we actually have to choose how we want to give back to this community, whether it's paying into a public goods fund or um, offering um, you know, developers to the open source project or money to the foundations or whatever, but some sort of concept like that where, com uh, where companies that are consuming these pieces of open software are incentivized, whether it's a carrot or a stick, I don't know, but they're incentivized to be contributing back to make the software better and more, um, more safe, more secure, and more longitudinally useful. I would do something that's not dissimilar where I would create a regulation that required stewards to be created. And I'd make the stewards not just of open source software, I would also make them data trusts, so mm -hmm. for open data as well. Mm -hmm. And I, I suspect you could have them, um, you can have an overarching, you can have them sector specific, you know, there's lots of ways to cut this. But I think it's something we can't escape, and I totally agree about the, the digital public good. Yeah, you need a, a steward, you need somebody, it's not a foundation because it doesn't necessarily create the projects and the code, 
but it might be the space that hosts the code for government usage, for public sector usage. A curator. And creates it. Well, it's not a curator, <laughs> it's a step further, because I see it as a steward, mm. and this is where we slightly disagree, because yeah. I see it as very much a public-private enterprise, and it's something that has to be funded by the state. And I think there's a need for a sort of UN of those, which was partly why I was so pleased Celine agreed to speak mm. this morning. We need that to be a global thing, and we need it to be something that's supranational and not just state by state. You know, there has to, And that's a big ask, and it's a big thing to take on, but that's my dream thing. Away from actual regulation, the other thing that I would do is ensure that the public sector started to have more appropriate procedures to sit mm. behind their policies. Because right now we have policies, but we don't have how you implement it. And I think we're going to take one last question and then wrap up. So Matt Jarvis has been very patient. Matt's um, on our board, so sorry, it's fine now. I, I, I'm going to be slightly uh, controversial, I think, here, because if you look at, at the last 25 years, right, of, 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 of free and open source software, there have actually been a ton of companies who've tried to do general purpose curation of, of open source. And I'm not talking about, you know, your uh, open core kind of model where they're supporting your own software, but in terms of a wide su support of a wide range of, of smaller projects. And I would argue that there's probably only Red Hat who's ever actually made any money out of it, right? So what's changed from the economic perspective that's going to make that business model work now when it hasn't worked in the past? Well, why it should work now, whether it will or not, that's an open question, <laughs> yeah. is because it is now fundamental to society in a way that it wasn't yeah. even three years ago that it, it is affecting every citizen and every government, maybe exception of North Korea or something, but basically everyone's affected by this. What role does the government have on behalf of its citizens to up-level this whole area? And, uh, and conversely, even if we take the kind of the, the most basic US regulation approaches, which is we're gonna through procurement say what we're willing to buy and it's gonna meet these standards, that is already, you can see, starting to cause curation, even if people don't use that word, because that's the only way to meet those regulations. So this is inevitable, actually. I don't think it's, we can discuss the form it takes, yeah, and we should, exactly. but this, this, if you have to choose between no security and no innovation, you're not gonna choose either one, right? So this is the path that can give us both. I see it already happening in various ways, but what's changed really is the, the need and the demand and how much trust we're placing in open source today compared to how much we were 15, 25 years ago. I think there's another component, which is when you look at Microsoft and Google, these are the best practices that have been developed for consuming open source. So, you know, it's not evenly distributed in terms of the future being here, but for the most part, both of our companies ingest software, make, you know, do some sort of review on it, go ahead and build it, then build our own internal feed anyway for these projects. So at some level, there is a, we are doing this, and it has become industry best practice. We, there's a very few people who, you know, go out and YOLO things off of, I guess not very few, there's still a lot of them. There's but time. There's still lots of them. Okay. <laughs> It is a product, no, but actually not, yeah. Yeah, I think we're at a point in time where the scale of adoption, and I've read so many reports around open source in the last couple of years. You know, during lockdown, it's pretty much all I did was read and talk about open source. And uh, the, the, just the scale of adoption is the point that makes the difference. But frankly, as an open source community, if we can't go out now and make money, and if we can't shift things now, we're never going to do it, so we might as well go home. So this is the moment, this is the time, and if we don't shift open source forward and ensure that curation is there, we're going to end up with a, a flip back to proprietary and this open collaborative innovation just won't have won. So with that, um, I'm going to wrap it up. It, I failed to introduce my uh, co-panelists very well. I, I just rushed everybody onto stage because I, I've done a lot of introducing today. And I should just thank Sarah Novotny, who is the Director of Open Source Strategy at Microsoft, and Eric Brewer, VP of Infrastructure and Google Fellow at Google. 
it's not often that anywhere in the world you get to sit on a stage or as an audience hear two people like this sitting talking together. And I'm deeply honoured um, on behalf of Open UK that you've made the, the trip over to be with us. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Amanda, Sarah, Eric, thank you so much for your uh, thought-provoking uh, session. I'm sure we don't think we're all going to pack up and go home, as uh, Amanda said, so we, we all need to work together to push, uh, continue uh, pushing the sustainability of open source. Right, so moving on to our next speaker. Um, I am delighted to welcome uh, Colin Eberhardt to the stage. Colin is the CTO of Scott Logic, which is a UK-based uh, software consultancy, in fact, based in Newcastle, I discovered earlier. Um, and uh, it works very much in the financial services industry, so he is uh, an active member of both Finos and the Linux Foundation, um, and is a technology enthusiast. He's a, he gets his hands dirty writing the software. So, Scott, please, welcome to the stage. Cool, thank you. Uh, just Whoa. Give me a sec while I plug in and get the tech sorted out. And remove the feedback. What's that, sorry? Uh, yeah, it's not detected the thing yet, which is problematic. Well, the mic's working. <laughs> uh, no, that's not. That's not it. Yeah. Doesn't matter, we've got another eight minutes. I mean, that is a picture of me. Oh, that's better. That's my other screen. Fantastic. If you bear with me, I shall. It is. That's, that's uh, Whitley Bay. It's a lovely picture. Hang on, was that was that a cheer for Whitley Bay? Well, no, I was walking there with the pen, so we had a great time on it. Oh, brilliant. Excellent. Cool. We are there. Great. Okay. Well, thanks for coming along. As as introduced, I'm Colin Eberhardt, I'm the CTO of Scott Logic, and I'm going to be asking a question today, which is could the public sector solve the open source sustainability challenges? And this is basically a talk of Two halves. The first is a little bit of research that I undertook myself a couple of years ago around open source sustainability and some of the challenges I uncovered. And the second is a research project that I undertook last year, which I feel gives a glimpse of some of the potential solutions. But first, a little bit about me. And you'll probably notice that isn't me, that's my dog. He's much better looking, so I thought I'd put him on the slide. I was also hoping to get a beautiful hand-drawn sketch of my dog. So if I just leave it on there for a little while, Fantastic. Um, I'll just keep it there. He's called Alfie, yeah? Okay. Um, I've been building open source for about the past 25 years. Um, I'm one of these people where if you look at my GitHub profile, it does look like a tiled bathroom. Um, and it, open source is something that's really an interesting intersection for me. It's part of my personal life. I, I code in my spare time, but also it's part of my professional life. As the CTO of a growing consultancy, I'm very much looking at how the work we can do can have a positive in impact on the open source world. But diving into the, to the sort of the main body of the talk. So uh, a, a few years ago, I started to get concerned about some of the security issues that were, that were occurring within the open source world, and it very much felt like these were on the rise. You'll have no doubt heard of Log4J, but years ago, before that actually made the news, there were a number of sort of smaller incidents that were, that were starting to become more, more, more frequent. Um, and this got me thinking, how much do I actually know about the code that I personally rely upon? And I thought, as a responsible developer, I should probably find out a little bit more. So what I did was I picked a project pretty much at random and decided I was going to perform a bit of a deep dive analysis to find out what is this code, where does it come from, and to be, to be honest, can I trust it? So the project I picked is Express.js. Some of you may have heard about this. Uh, Express is pretty much the de facto web server for Node. So if you're running 
uh, Node or running JavaScript, you'll almost certainly be using this in some, some fashion. Now, Node's got almost 60,000 stars on GitHub. It's in the top 100 of projects on GitHub. It's a tremendously uh, popular open source project. So I thought this is a good subject for my analysis. It's also supported by OpenJS, which are part of the Linux Foundation. So it's a tremendously uh, mature project. And my first experience was, yeah, I loved it. It works really well, quality software, and at a great price, free. You know, what, what, what is there not to love? But then what I did was I started to delve, you know, open up the covers and start looking under the hood and, and look at how is Express actually built. So I started downloading the project metadata and looking at how the project evolved over time. Now, the first thing to point out is Express isn't one project. Express is actually 49 projects. And over time, the complexity has increased. So you can see the number of dependencies on the, on the uh, y-axis uh, and time on the x-axis. And typically, what happens is the number of dependencies grow over time. And then at major version releases, there's often a, um, a period of consolidation, reducing dependencies. Then it grows once again. This is pretty typical these days. Virtually every piece of software that you will be using will be composed of a fairly significant number of other software projects. That's just the way it is these days. I'm kind of okay with that, but I'm starting to feel a little bit uneasy because initially I thought, right, I want to learn about Express, find out how secure that is, and do I trust it? I, I don't have one problem now. I've got 49 problems. I've now got 49 projects that I really should start paying a bit more attention to. Unfortunately, that's actually the tip of a much larger iceberg. The, uh, with Express, it has 195 development dependencies. So what this means is the supply chain used to actually compile and run Express is even bigger. Now, should I care about this? Uh, well, Yes, you, you should. You'll have almost certainly heard of software supply chain attacks. It was something that people weren't really talking about you know, four or five years ago, but now it's, it's much more um, well known. So a software supply chain attack is where I attack one of these dependencies that's part of the process of building Express, and I use that as a way to inject my malicious code. People have used this to do things like um, uh, Bitcoin mining or stealing, uh, stealing keys for Bitcoin wallets or all kinds of other sort of interesting attacks. Um, interestingly, Eric talked about having a, a list of critical software, um, er Eric from Google, and how Log4j wasn't ever on what, what they considered to be the list of critical software. I think the whole principle of creating a critical software list is actually fundamentally flawed. Any software that, that you use in production is critical, it's an attack vector, and any software that is part of your supply chain is critical, it's, a, it's an attack vector. So I don't believe you can condense it down to a hundred or a couple of hundred projects. They're all critical, they're all susceptible to attack. So yeah, this complexity is starting to make me a little bit nervous now. You know, the further, further I go down the rabbit hole, the more concerned I get. The next question I asked is, if I install Express, or you install Express, do you get exactly the same thing? That's not always the case. The way that this complex graph of dependencies is built up is by a, a clever concept called semantic versioning. It's a way of saying, um, I depend on version 1.5, but sure, 1.6, that's fine, I'll, I'll take that. And once you've got a complex dependency graph of 195 dependencies, it gets even more complicated. So between Express 4.16.4 and 4.17, there are actually 33 different variants of Express due to this um, dependency tree. Yeah, I'm getting pretty scared now. This is getting really, really quite complicated. So probably the most critical question that I asked myself next was, who holds the keys? Who determines when one of these pieces of software gets released to NPM, which is a standard distribution mechanism. So I took a look at it. Of the 49 dependencies, there were 88 maintainers. So what this means is there are 88 individuals who are actively able to deploy code, which becomes part of Express. So there are 88 people who are involved in the distribution process. Unfortunately, only 9% of developers have two-factor authentication enabled on NPM. That was a statistic published in 2020. As a result of this, I now have the email addresses of all 88 maintainers. I took the very first one, 
and I typed it into a website that, that you can use to determine whether an email address has been disclosed as part of a, 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 an attack. And the very first one had. The very first one, I had one of their passwords. Now, considering a lot of people recycle passwords, I'm willing to bet that if I spent half an hour, I could get into one of these accounts. Now, trust me, I didn't do that, <laughs> honest, but it, it's fairly obvious that there's a certain amount of fragility here. So yeah, I'm, I'm getting really scared about this now. And in all honesty, Express was the first project that I picked quite by random. I wasn't expecting to uncover something which made me felt, feel so concerned and uncomfortable. So the final question I ask myself is, who is carrying the ultimate burden here? Who is making sure that I'm safe? Who is worrying about all of this complexity on my behalf? Who is at the top of the pile in Express? Who is the maintainer of Express? Or who, what is the community around Express? Unfortunately, there isn't really a community. There's one individual. There's one maintainer who carries the burden for, for the majority of the work that is undertaken with, within Express, which is actually not terribly unusual these days with open source software. Quite often, there will be one core maintainer or maybe one or two core maintainers for the software that you rely upon. And uh, finding out more about this individual, it didn't take me too long to find out that this particular individual wasn't terribly happy. It was only a year before I started doing this analysis that I discovered that um, there had been a vulnerability disclosed relating to Express. A lot of security vendors had, had messaged all of their clients about a particular CVE. So all of a sudden, of the 29 million downloads, there were probably 29 million people all of a sudden going, oh, we've got a security vulnerability. Doug, that's the name of the maintainer, can you sort it out for us? <laughs> Funnily enough, this didn't go down terribly well, especially as someone tried to propose a fix, which uh, Doug effectively said, that's not the right way to do it. Under the increasing pressure of, of his clients, in air quotes, he said, I'm giving up on this. I'm walking away from my computer for the weekend, and I'll come back and sort it out later. And again, this was a project I picked at random. It happened again three years ago in 2016. Doug walked away from the project. It happened again in 2014 when the original author of Express, TJ, took the slightly unusual approach of selling Express to a third party vendor, which a lot of people were not terribly happy about, but I can kind of understand where he's get, coming from. He, he felt undervalued. He wanted to get rid of this project and someone was going to give him some money for it. I'm, to be honest, I'm less disappointed that he sold the project. I'm more disappointed that he just didn't get much money for, for it. Because honestly, it's worth more than just half a month's pay. That's the sad thing. And I'll finish with a, with a, a quote I, I, I read that it's not fun anymore. You get literally nothing for maintaining a popular package. And this is an, an increasing problem within open source at the moment. So, what are the solutions to these problems? There, there must be a solution out there. Uh, we've actually heard what, uh, a little bit about one of these solutions earlier, money. Obviously, money is the answer to a great many things. There, you can solve a lot of things by throwing money at it. And there's a lot of talk at the moment about funding open source. And that's definitely something we should be considering. However, uh, I thought, OK, let's have a look at Express. Let's see if there's anything within Express that's funded. Nothing was funded. So I looked at the software supply chain, the full 195 dependencies, and I found out of those projects, there was one that was funded, and it's called ESLint. It's a, it's a linting tool. It's a tool that helps um, enforce certain coding conventions, uh, and it's a really good project. ESLint is supported by Open Collective. You've probably heard of Open Collective. Uh, Tidelift is another popular, um, a popular organization that helps fund open source projects. So this is, there's this one project within all of Express that has uh, some support. So I turned my attention to Open Collective. I thought, OK, how much of a difference are they actually making at the moment? So I looked at the top 30 projects within, Ex within Open Collective to see how much uh, funds they were collecting. Here you can see we've got, I don't know how easy you can see it from the back, but this is a log scale um, of the, uh, I converted it from dollars into FTE equivalents. So using a standard developer salary, how many full-time developers would it fund? 
ES Lint is, uh, has enough money coming in to fund one and a bit developers. It's actually in the top, top I think it's, it was in the top three at the time. Only six of the projects on Open Collective at the time that I acquired this data have enough to fund one or more full-time equivalents. As soon as you get out of the top 30, there's enough money to uh, fund 0.01 full-time equivalent. So outside of the top 30, there's enough money for, for coffee, basically. Now, I, I really don't want to be, uh, come across as being uh, super critical about Open Collective. I think it's a fantastic project, but taking a step back, there's a vast mismatch going on here. Um, Open UK published the State of Open report in 2021. The GDP contribution of open source, they, they estimate to be 43 billion. Open Collective had a bumper year in 2021 and raised $12 million. So the amount that they are raising each year is increasing considerably, but there's this massive gap going on. Um, Tidelift, um, they, they have a, a VC funding. I think recently they had another 27 million. Again, these sound like big numbers, but they feel like a, a tiny droplet compared to the overall worth and value of open source. But also, I genuinely think that money is an important part of the solution. But I think one thing that I want to make crystal clear is that it's not the only solution, and it's not the only way that we're going to solve the sustainability challenges in open source. And to tell you a little bit more about the other part of the solution, I just want to reference this fantastic book by Nadia Eggball, which is called um, Working in Public. She uh, interviewed a significant number of maintainers, uh, a, a number of people within the open source community to find out a little bit more about how it actually works, to find out about the motives of the individuals involved. And one of the interesting things is GitHub, whilst being a fantastic platform that has made it a lot easier for people to work in open source, it has also resulted in a slightly strange dynamic where a lot of people have a very transitive and fleeting relationship with open source projects. When I first started out in open source, people tended to uh, stick to a particular project and have a tight-knit community. Now people tend to move all over the place and the community is, is, is really quite fluid. Uh, you, you'll have heard earlier from an economic perspective that some people consider open source to be public goods. I don't think it is. The definition of public goods is it's non-rivalrous. And there's a general consideration that the, there is zero cost to the replication of software, which is absolutely true. It's a digital good. You can copy it, and it doesn't cost money. It's not non-rivalrous. However, that's not the case. Consumption does come at a cost. When overconsumption occurs, the finite resource that we are fighting over is the maintainer's time. And one of the most important take-home messages I, I, I found from this book is, Attention is the most prized asset of maintainers, and attention isn't something you can necessarily buy with money. So just to make that clear, a lot of open source maintainers create software for the love of it and for the joy of it. And if they get bombarded with um, angry demands to fix security issues, that takes away the time that they want to spend on what they love. And again, this is why there is a rivalrous element to open source. And a fantastic demonstration of how that can go horribly wrong is DigitalOcean's Hacktoberfest. Now, they, they've run this competition a number of years running, and it sounds like a good idea. And I, at first, I thought it was a good idea. They give away t-shirts to people who make successful contributions to open source. And on the surface, that genuinely sounds like a great idea. Um, however, what happens this year is that there was a significant number of very low quality contributions, people basically putting in junk pull requests in the hope of getting t-shirts. The impact this had on, on the community was significant and one of the maintainers basically um, said that it was a corporate sponsored denial of service attack on open source, which is a pretty extreme way of, of sort of describing their, the, 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 uh, the attack on their attention, to use Nadia's language. At this point, I want to follow a completely separate path for a while, and, and bear with me, the two paths will converge in the very near future. So last year, I worked with some of my colleagues and in close collaboration with Linux Foundation Research to create a, 
a relatively comprehensive picture of open source across Europe. We, we undertook a survey, we surveyed around about 1,500 people, interviewed a large number of individuals across various different sectors, various different countries, to see what, see what we could find about open source across Europe. And we published a report that looks at consumption, contribution, creation, all sorts of things. I'd love to tell you more about the report. I could waffle on about it for hours, but all I'm gonna, I don't have time to. I'm just going to pull out a very narrow thread that, that emerged within this report. And that thread relates to public sector. In almost every question we asked, public sector was an outlier. And unfortunately, it didn't tend to be an outlier in a terribly good fashion. More often than not, you look at the data, oh, public sector there's something weird going on there. So I want to, to pull on that thread a little bit. But before I do, I think uh, within the UK, we generally consider the public sector to be quite pro-open source. And this is a pattern that we see across Europe. So the Open Source Observatory published this fantastic report quite recently where they took a systematic approach uh, to look at the, um, the uh, legal and the, the sort of political legislation around open source, and they created this fantastic catalog. You can see virtually, I mean, you can't really read the writing here, you can probably just about make out the numbers, but virtually every country within the EU and the UK uh, has uh, legal or political policies around various aspects of open source, whether it's adoption, whether it's consumption. The, policy is, the policies are really quite clear. Governments are keen on open source. And our survey uh, echoed exactly the same sentiment. So we asked, to what extent is open source important to your sector? And those within the public sector said, yes, we strongly agree, open source is, is important to our sector. Those in finance and telecoms were a bit more, mm, it's important-ish. That's great. However, when we started to look at the detail and what was happening on a more day-to-day -day basis, things were not quite so good. So this is, we asked people a question about the contribution policy within their organization. So moving from left to right, you're looking at contribution is encouraged, so quite permissive. Permitted, um, so not quite so um, open and encouraged, but yes, you can do it. No clear policy, don't know, or prohibited. You'll notice I've highlighted public sector. Only 29% of individuals within public sector were, felt that they were encouraged to contribute to open source. The thing that I find quite sad is that, I can't quite make out the number now, I think 58% reported that there was no clear policy. That seems like a really bizarre contrast to the fact that you can read a great many EU policies around open source. However, when it comes to the engineers on the ground, it, it's not something that they can relate to in their day-to-day -day life. Another thing we asked them is about factors that limit their involvement in open source. So there, I've just picked out uh, a couple of the most, um, most highly reported factors that people feel are limiting. So a lack of policy or a lack of understanding. And this time what we did was we divided the data set into two halves. One half is where, where the individual reported that their organization has an open source program office or some form of leadership and those without. What we found is that in the presence of an open source uh, program office or leadership, far fewer people reported a lack of policy as a limiting factor. So what this shows you is it, with OSPOs or leaderships, the limiting factors are significantly reduced. So this begs the question, people within public sector, do they have OSPOs or, or leadership? I think you can probably guess. No, they don't. So we asked about open source enablers. And if we look across the different sectors, uh, only 12% within public sector are aware of an open source program office within the area that they work. 12% um, visible leadership. These are really quite low with respect to other sectors. Also, interestingly, members of open source organizations. You're, if you look at Linux Foundation membership list, it's primarily private companies. There's very little representation of public sector organizations. And that was echoed in our survey findings. The final thing we asked was, where, uh, you know, taking a step back, where do people feel we should see more investment in open source? And the overwhelming majority of respondents, whether they worked in public sector or not, said that they wish to see a greater government involvement and consumption of open source. And I think Frederick says it quite neatly here, public money, public code. code. There's a general feeling that the government should be investing more in open source. So, 
so far I've presented two distinct problems. Um, some significant sustainability challenges in open source and my, my general belief that you know, we've got some challenges there that we have to better understand the maintainers and the community in order to be able to solve them. And then the other problem, there's a general desire to leverage open source in public sector, but that isn't actually translating into actionable policies. So how do we turn these two sort of problems into a solution? How do we make two and two equal five? Now, I'm not going to claim to have all of the answers. I'm starting to see what I think is a, is a kind of a, a glimmer of hope. Now, for me, there's a fundamentally different dynamic uh, when you remove the need for organizations to compete with each other. And within public sector, that is the case. Public sector bodies are not in competition, and that does create a different dynamic. We lean on that dynamic and we rely on that dynamic. Uh, we expect our governments to protect public and common goods. We expect them to, to protect the environment and common land. Yes, we expect private enterprise to do that also, but we understand that the government has a far greater obligation. We should also be uh, leaning on the government to protect open source. However, at the moment, that feels like a, an entirely unrealistic goal. We have the policy, but it's not translating into something that's actionable on the ground. So I think there are probably a lot of things that need to be done, but to me, there are two that are the most high priority. The first is public sector really does have to become a part of the community. And how they do it, there are various different routes they could take. They could join the community, build the community, find the community. And by this I mean some of the communities that we already have may not be right for public sector. Another thing that we asked within our survey is, what are your main motivations for participating in open source? The vast majority of respondents said it was for interoperability and innovation those that were in private sector. And, and this is a, a common theme. If you're in the private sector, generally you're joining these organizations to improve interop, to, to open up your, your platform to a greater customer base or to access innovation. Public sector wants something quite different. They want transparency and cost reduction. So it may be a case that they need uh, a different community. They need, may need to build their own community that serves their more specific needs. But above all, I think public sector is very much crying out for some form of leadership. It's very much lacking at the moment, and I think that's probably the biggest obstacle to actually um, uh, you know, achieving the goals that they're setting out in their policies. So they, they certainly need more open source leaders and, and open source program offices. Now, at the moment, recent news, Google has laid off quite a lot of their open source leaders. I think that's an opportunity. <laughs> I mean, uh, to be fair, these two things are not going to happen overnight and they're not going to solve everything, but I do honestly think they are a, a great step in the right direction. So can the public sector solve the open source sustainability challenges? That's a question that I think, you know, I'll, I'll be asking myself, it, you know, in the next months and years. It's not, a, it's not an, a, an obvious success, but personally I think it's one of the best bets we have. So, thank you. Thank you, Scott. Uh, really, Colin. Uh, Colin. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get it round the right way. Uh, <coughs> questions. We have some uh, lady over the far side I had a hand up first, just, and then followed by the gentleman at the end of the row. I want to see if I've got a picture of my dog yet. Hi, Colin. <laughs> uh, thank you for the talk. I'm Malvika Sharan, um, and I'm very interested in this topic, mostly because uh, I lead a few communities in open science uh, which are trying to engage with different sectors. Yep. And we've actually met few public sector personnel, and as you said, there's a strong desire and intention to engage. Yes. But time uh, seems to be lacking from, from the public sector sides, as, as you said, that a lot of people probably are working in their own time or interest. Um, how do we as a community actually try to bridge that gap? Um, because in your one of the slides that said join a community, and I think that's the right thing to do. There are so many communities out there um, to bridge the gap. It's actually useful to engage with the existing community rather than building another silo. So yeah, I would love to hear what do you think would be the right approach from our community sides to engage with public sector? Uh, that's, that's tricky. I think one of the things that, I think people, People within public sector need to be educated to a certain extent, and I don't mean educated in a patronizing fashion. Another thing that I think is, 
is somewhat related is um, within the UK there has been a, a, a general tendency to outsource quite a lot of software um, to, to third parties, which I think is a good thing to do, but outsource the creation of it, but don't outsource the expertise. And I think there's been a tendency to accidentally outsource too much, outsource the expertise. And as a result, you lose the understanding of, of the significance of, of open source. So again, it's, uh, it's a difficult one to, to really answer, but to me, it always comes back to education because it's, and that's why, that's why I did my own research at the beginning about Express.js. Until you actually roll up your sleeves and start looking at the detail, it's very hard to gain an understanding of just how fragile the open source uh, infrastructure is. And again, I, I've, I'd reiterate that uh, so handing that problem to someone else isn't the way to solve it. Again, I think a lot of these organizations, open, uh, open SSF, Open Collective, I think they do a fantastic job, but we shouldn't just look at them and go, okay, they've got it sorted out. Open SSF has sorted out security. Open Collective has sorted out funding. They are a fantastic, or they're fantastic organizations, but we also have to take responsibility ourselves. And that means understanding the code we're using, understanding where it comes from, understanding the dynamic. Um, quite, quite often in my day job, when people start, you know, oh, we'll, we'll use this particular component because it's free. I do say to people, yeah, it's free, great. Just spend a bit of time finding out a little bit more about the community behind that because it's our responsibility to, to you know, understand the code that we're using. So again, education, but that's a long, waffly, slightly roundabout answer. Uh, thanks, Colin. Uh, my name's Kaylin. I have two questions. The first is quite specific about your analysis of ESLint, and the second is yeah. more open about funding. So the first one, you showed your analysis on the log scale, and you said that uh, the funding that comes through ESLint is enough to pay a, sal uh, a, a developer's salary. Yep. I was wondering what time, time period was that? Okay. Was that so an annual salary? That particular analysis I did in 2020, I think I took, I think I took a relatively generous um, FTE salary that, that um, was a uh, yeah San Francisco in dollars. So in I'm from the Newcastle in in the UK. It could have probably got you know six full time engineers <laughs> there. But considering I I perceive the quality of a lot of this software to be your kind of San Francisco quality, I used that as a particular metric. Again, it's. It, it's a crude way of presenting it, but I didn't want to just put it in, in terms of money. I wanted mm -hmm. to, to express it in terms of effort. So yeah, it was cool. the equivalent to how much would it cost to, to have a, an experienced engineer with living in a relatively expensive location. Cool. Thank you. And the second question is, um, are there any models or examples of public sector funding models that you think are um, quite inspiring? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not aware of any public sector funding models. I, I know that there are some, um, I've forgotten, there's, there's one in Germany that is... Sovereign it, Tech Fund. Yeah, exactly. So it's Sovereign Tech Fund. And they are doing something similar to OpenSSF in that they are, they've identified some critical software projects that they are supporting, I, I believe financially and possibly with effort as well. And again, I, I don't want to knock that sort of thing. That is, that does, that really helps in some areas, but it's not the complete solution. We can't rely on sovereign tech fund, open SSF, and open collective. We, again, we need to take on some of that responsibility ourselves. Any other questions? Yeah, hi, Colin. My name is Rene. Um, you said that public sector is missing leadership. Of what level of age? What level of government does is that leadership lacking? Is it the cabinet level? Is it individual agency level, or is it um, GDS level? Like where, where do you think it would be more impactful that leadership to come from? Mm. Uh, I think it has, it, the, the problem is we've got policy and intention. It's not being translated into something that the people doing the work can understand. So I, I'm less concerned about where it sits within the government organization. It has to be something on an engineering level that, c converts the intention into something practical and useful. I work quite a lot in financial services, and there are lots of significant obstacles around using open source due to regulations and compliance. However, there, there are ways through it, and you need, you need the, the technical expertise to create the path that others can follow. So, um, and, and again, it's, you know, 
typically it does have to be at a relatively senior level because you are going to have to exert quite a bit of influence. So sometimes the decisions that you need to make can be quite uncomfortable. Uh, again, when it comes to contributing, uh, you have to describe... Uh, most projects are, are, are under pressure to deliver. You, to be able to contribute, you need a bit of slack. In, in your delivery, which again is something that's incredibly hard to, to negotiate. But yeah, regardless of where it sits, it has to be a role that can convert intention into something that's consumable by the people that are actually um, writing the code who are, or managing the projects. A second part as well. Are there any, I think you listed a, a list of countries where I think they got this right and where UK was right at the bottom. Is there any country you think we can mostly learn from, a copy and model from them? Not, not that I'm aware of, no. I mean, ag again, most of, our, most of our insights across Europe came from surveys which were uh, people's experience on the ground. And I'd point to the uh, European Observatory if you, want to, if you want to come in at the policy level. So we came in at the practitioner level uh, and we can see a correlation between the two. Uh, we have not done the policy level analysis. Okay, hi. Uh, so I'm Laura Cole, and I'm actually from the UK government. I'm part of the civil service in the yeah. Department for Digital, Culture, Media and Sports. Um, and so I have a couple of points. One slightly bit of a plug, because we are kind of looking at this sort of stuff at the moment, but also a much broader question. Um, so we're doing quite a lot of work at the moment on software resilience, and open source is, of course, a massive part of that, part of why I'm here. I'm here to learn about what we should be doing. So we have a call for views that is open, where we particularly want to hear from people such as, you know, everyone in this room about how we should be doing this. So please do look at that and perhaps come along to a workshop we're doing tomorrow. Um, but a question for you as well is thinking about, I mean, a big challenge for us is, you know, how open source communities work is, is so different to how government works. And we want to sort of, you know, improve how we work together. So I guess my question is, you know, how, how do you think we should do that? You know, how should we as government officials learn more about how you work, kind of, you know, speak more in your language. Do you have any thoughts on how we can do that? I think the best place to start is um, look, at, look at the code that you're using, because th there, there isn't, it's um, getting back to, uh, where is it? The book that, that Nadia uh, published, oh, it's not on there, okay, that Nadia published. Uh, she came up with uh, four different models for open source that, that four different common uh, mechanisms that, that people use to organize themselves. I, I forget all of them, but one of them was the stadium model, where you have a, a very small number of maintainers and a huge number of, of intermittent contributors. One of them was a sort of club model, where you have a close-knit collection of, of people who, who uh, genuinely know each other effectively as friends. There are various different models. I, I'd suggest look at the software that you're relying on and, and directly learn about that rather than learning about it on a, on a theoretical basis. Because, again, the, you, uh, you really do need to start know, learning more about the open source that you rely upon. Because uh, my, my general feeling is, uh, you know, I work as a, a consultant and we ship, we ship code to, to our clients, which are then their end users use it. Now, if there's a problem in our supply chain, if Express gets attacked, I c and, a, and a client machine gets compromised, we can't say, oh, it's not us, it was someone else. Everything that you ship becomes your code. So I think the first starting point is, is always to learn more about what you are actually shipping and what you are relying upon. And that will get you into the communities. You'll start asking that question. You'll start looking through your bill of materials and start asking yourself, okay, who wrote that? You know, uh, if we... If we have an issue with that, who do we talk to? If we want to enhance that or extend that, how do we do that? And start working, working through on a practical basis rather than a sort of theoretical basis. That, that, that would be my advice. We've got time for one more. One more. Okay. Um, I'm James. I'm from the Met Office. So I was just wondering what kind of practical actions should people, uh, particularly technical people within public sector organizations, be taking? Um, so what, what form of contribution is the most beneficial? Is it sort of financial? Is it have, putting aside some time to actually contribute on a regular basis? Yeah, uh, I, considering there is such a gap between where 
public sector is and where it should be, I'm going to go in really, really modest, incredibly modest. Um, a, a, a habit that I see more and more often, well, I see quite often, is people are slightly afraid of in, engaging. I, I quite often, you know, even engineers in our own company where I try to instill an open source mindset, I'll find someone who, uh, who may be stuck for a whole afternoon, can't quite, you know, can't make something work the way they want to, or there's a bug that they're fighting against. And I'll say, why haven't you raised an issue? Why haven't you sort of tr tried to engage with the community? And I think that would be my, my one recommendation, just instill in everyone that it's okay to raise an issue. It's okay to, to actually, uh, and again, raising an issue does, makes it almost sound confrontational. I, I'd say start having conversations with the community because once you start feeling more comfortable that the, the open source community isn't something over there, once you start building bridges from where you are to where they are, you, you will eventually become part of the same community. And again, that's all very hand wavy, but that will start to solve some of these problems. Cool. Right. Thank you, Colin. I'll yeah. get it right this time. <laughs> I, have, I have spotted a little head of a dog oh, over there. <laughs> uh, right, so we've got a break now. We time to go and uh, chat to people, make, meet new people, meet the community. Uh, we, car uh, we start again here in an hour at four o'clock. Um, and at uh, four o'clock we will be talking about the villain's guide of how to lose your community. So see you back then.
Whenever you're ready, it's fine. It's fine. I'm good. Good afternoon. Um, welcome to the next session of the Government Legal and Policy. Have I got it right? I'm, I'm really struggling with this, getting this all in the right order. Um, my name's... On the bottom. Government Law and Policy. Well, I was close. Um, my name's Judy Parnell. I'm from the BBC uh, Research and Development Department, and uh, I'm host of this uh, track this week. Um, I would like to introduce you to our first speaker in this session. This is Matt Junkowitz, who is the Head of Open Source Strategy at SCARF, and he's been sort of kicking around the community for 20 years or so, at various companies and all popping up all over the place. Uh, a real passionate advocate of open source and uh, hosts several related podcasts as well. And um, yes... Super Villain Workshop. Did you know you were going to get one of those? Matt, please. Thank you. Thank you. How many aspiring super villains do we have out there? Ooh, we've got a few. We've got a few aspiring super villains. Well, as uh, you know, uh, Judy was saying, I am Matt Yankovic. You can reach me at all the different socials that you want to reach me at. And um, I work for SCARF. Um, we also do a podcast on hacking open source business. Um, SCARF basically helps uh, open source projects grow their adoption, figure out who's adopting their software, help the, you know, analyze some of the uh, adoption metrics. So we also have um, a new uh, community that we just launched, the open source metrics, um, which actually goes through all the open source business metrics you should be looking at. Um, it goes beyond just the contributor metrics. Is metrics. So I've talked about this at FOSTEM. If you're interested, there is a FOSTEM talk out there. Now, I have to give the obligatory warning. I'm going to tell you things that you probably don't want to do, okay? Um, this is, I still have my regular hat on, so I can warn you a little bit to what I'm going to talk about. Um, but uh, I would not recommend most of these, but unfortunately, these are things that you still, still see a lot of companies in the ecosystem, a lot of people in the ecosystem do. So I'm going to go full on evil now. I'm going to change my hat. I'm going to put on my supervillain hat. And you might be asking why villains, right? Most of the open source software that we have was started to be developed in kind of contrast to what was already out there. If you think about, like, I come from the database space, the database space, there was a lot of love for companies like Oracle back in the day. Um, I don't know if anybody had run an Oracle database or remember those days. There was not, you know, eh, eh. So there needed to be a villain in order to generate innovation. So what I've done is, I'm a big movie fan. I've learned from many villains over the course of my career. And so I want to talk to you about a few of them. So as aspiring villains, the first thing we need to realize is, what do we think about community? We don't need it. We need minions. Minions are more important than community. You want people to just follow exactly what you say and have no independent thought, because that will help you get to the top. And so if we have more minions, that is good. But we also want people to think well of you. So we want people to think that you're an open source champion. We want them to think that you are awesome and outstanding because it's better to wait until people don't suspect that you have ulterior motives or that you're thinking more about yourself or the business um, at the same time. And you can use this play to actually make more money. For instance, 
you can take other people's software, remove the copyrights, and claim it's your own. Because, you know, people will then think that maybe you invented that. And then later on, you can switch licenses to lock people in. Those are always good, solid villain plays, and it's things like this that really help us move to the next level, get to the next level, get, uh, use that fame to get into bigger institutions where then we can dominate those industries. Better yet, we can even use the open source to mine more value out of companies. So these are all kind of classic plays for that evil open source champion. But we also want to think about different things that we should do, like who doesn't like to blame other people, right? So if Scar taught me anything in The Lion King, it's that you want to blame other people for all your evil deeds. So step one here would be to appoint a board and give them no power. Because what is greater than being on an open source board and then being told no or being overruled every chance you get? That's awesome. And because of this, you get your scapegoat, which is awesome as well. And on top of that, sometimes you can get board spots that people will pay lots of money for. And that means more money coming into your pockets, which is an awesome thing that we like to do. And you know, healthy projects value a lot of variety and opinions and people. You don't want that. You want single thought, everybody thinking behind that. And remember, don't forget to sell those board spots to the highest bidder. Now, of course, I don't know if anybody remembers Dr. Horrible. He is one of my favorite supervillains, if, if you remember. The world is a mess. I just need to rule it. That is the mentality that every aspiring evil supervillain should have. Sharing is for losers. You need to keep full control of that project. Do not let anyone else tell you anything else. Make sure you ignore users' feedback. I know, I know users hate it when you ignore them. But you know what? It's one way that people will run away in droves. Yes, it's great. And also, make sure you tell everyone why they're wrong and you're right. Because you want to convince them immediately that you have the right way. Now, this goes along with my favorite, one of my favorite supervillains, Darth Vader. And Darth Vader, of course, finds you know, your lack of faith disturbing. So whenever somebody opens up new PRs, they ask for feature requests, just reject them outright and just say, because. Right? And then, I know what's best for the project. Just have faith in me. And if they do try and dissuade you or try and change your mind or get something that you don't want, make sure you stomp on that quickly. Now, diversity. This is a big topic. And you can redefine and ignore diversity in a large variety of ways, because why would you want to do that? Well, diversity is good for the community, right? A lot of empathy, a lot of innovation. Um, you know, welcoming people bring in more, OK? But if you're trying to bring down a community, those are things you don't necessarily want. Now, if you ignore diversity, it will take a while to limit your long-term viability, but it will. So that's a good first step, but keep in mind, there are lots of trolls who don't like diversity, so you might actually attract some more people to your community. And if you are going to attract people to your community, why not strive for diversity in the way of more trolls, toxic people, and prima donnas? That will always help your community and your project. Now, no compromises, right? We don't want to compromise on what we're building, what we're releasing. We want to make sure, again, we rule that with an iron fist. So when you do have two competing ideas, it's best to let two people go at it in the Thunderdome. And whoever comes out alive, they will get their PRs accepted, or they will get their features accepted. This is a really good way to limit the amount of people who are coming in, because you know not everyone's kind of survival of the fittest there. So death matches, when it comes to open source, are often encouraged to destroy your community. Now, this also in, you know, lets you have survival of the fittest, which we all know is a really good way to help new people come into the community. Now, a code of conduct is really good. It keeps people safe, but your code of conduct should include the Thunderdome. Make sure you do that in every code of conduct. Now, we want to feed the trolls, okay? Now, a lot of people say, don't feed the trolls, but he who controls the, contr the trolls controls the kingdom, and you want to be that person. So trolls and toxic people are a force multiplier for you. You can eliminate more people in the community 
by bringing more trolls in. And they're gonna do the work for you. So instead of having just one person who's trying to bring down the community, you can have many people who bring down the community. And what's great is if you reward these people, they'll do it even more. So it's always good to look for those toxic trolls and make sure that they're getting the credit for the things that you know, are going on in the project, even if they're not the originators. Now, another really good tactic is put them in charge, right? So who doesn't like moderators who are trolls? Moderators who are trolls who come out and make everyone else feel little or petty is often a good strategy. And when you're sick of dealing with the trolls, they're going to go away in a spectacular flame out fashion. Of course, they're gonna try and tear down your community as they go as well, so it really accelerates the process. Now, we also want to make contributing harder. And you know, this means a lot of paperwork, a lot of redundancy, a lot of redundant processes and forms. Now, how many people have a good contributor guide? Nobody? Well, good, you're on your way then if you don't have a good contributor guide to actually being a good supervillain. I'm very proud of you, right? Bury that contributor guide, make it harder for people to find, and then people will go away and they won't contribute, okay? And this is my favorite strategy is you, you should put a check right in there. If someone doesn't submit a PR at least 10 times in a row, they don't really want it. So just let them kind of go auto-reject until it's the 10th time, and then you can figure out some other strategy. But 10 times is the minimum, okay? Ignore all code contributions until they sign away all your rights because you wanna own everything that they contribute and make a very strict style guideline and reject everything that doesn't hit 100% perfect punctuation, grammar, whatever it is. Make it so it is very onerous. And never, ever, 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 ever give feedback, okay? Very important, new people coming into the community, old people coming, you know, that have been in the community, they want feedback on what they're developing, and if you don't give it to them, then that drives them nuts, and if they're getting driven nuts enough, they'll go somewhere else. We also wanna make people jump through hoops, okay? I went back to Darth Vader, yes. Right, gonna alter the deal over and over again, and people can pray that we don't alter it further. We want people to join the community and then have to jump through lots and lots of hoops. Onerous CLA agreements, unreasonable code of conduct, build process and bureaucracy for everything. Switch your licenses frequently, right? You should be switching your license every three months if possible. I mean, this is something that really goes over well um, with the community. <laughs> uh, persistence surely will benefit them. This, think of this as a learning exercise, right? You want them to be persistent in, in going through this, and this is gonna teach them a valuable life lesson someday. Don't know what it is, but you know, maybe how to deal with difficult people. So ignoring new people, right? So this one is a classic supervillain play. You don't want new people, right? The whole goal is to destroy your community, not create more people in the community. So the best way to do that is to ignore them and then let them know that you're ignoring them by answering other people's questions, right? Make it harder for them to get started. This is critical. This is super critical. You don't want them to get started in that community. Eventually, they'll move on to something else and even the current community will move on if you ignore them. And as the community gets an older vibe to it, as it grows older, they'll start to disappear. They'll migrate to something else. So you're good. Attrition will start to dwindle your numbers until your community is nothing. So no new people, right? Now, President Snow has played a lot of games, but what we wanna do is increase the difficulty in getting started using our software and our project, not just for contributors, but also for those who are using it and running it. So before someone gets to the community, um, they're gonna try your software. So anything you can do to make that more difficult, the better. Some good techniques. You may only install my software from source, okay? No other distribution mechanism. You must install it from source, that will limit things. And you need to have 237 dependencies that all need to be dis installed independently. Those are good, good tactics. Also, you must have internet access for the install. Maybe that's for you know, a later point where we might collect some PII or something on you. 
and either support only the latest version of the code, the one that isn't even GA yet, or the oldest version of code that you can possibly find, right? So if you're running on like, you know, uh, you know Red Hat you know, 2, that's good. You know, that, that's, that's your base image. Or if you're on the very cutting edge, either way. Now, make this setup as manual as possible. Configuration options are there for a reason. And we want people to explore every one of them. So no sane defaults. Make it absolutely the worst defaults possible. That it will really help drive people insane. Now, we all know that as project maintainers, as founders of companies, as, as those in charge of the community, our time is really valuable. In fact, I you know, feel some days where I just want to sit down and you know, play Call of Duty or something. It's OK. But what you need to do is let all of your community know that you are too busy for them. Your time is more valuable. When you have better things to do, don't answer questions, right? Treat people like they're wasting your time because they are. And when people submit things, keep the feedback to yourself again, right? You, you don't want to tell people you know, what you're doing. You just tell them, yeah, I don't got time for that. And when people get complained or concerned, just ignore them or send them to those toxic people. People love to be ignored, trust me. Now, if anyone does mess up and they do submit PRs or things that are obviously wrong, instead of helping them, you want to make fun of them, right? We want to call them out. We want to say, jump all over them and tell them how they're wrong because that's you know, some way that is going to drive them away, right? There's far too much coddling sometimes. So what we want to do is we want to make sure we call out any small, tiny mistake. You missed a period here. How could you do that? You should you know, go back and you know, learn grammar. Stuff like that. Now, if you're going to give credit, give credit to yourself. Who doesn't like to give credit to yourself, right? So Gaston, ta uh, Gaston ta ta told us that you know, he was going to take us and show us the trophies, right? So, Make sure that yourself gets credit before everybody else, and maybe a few cronies if you, you know, have some of those. But that always endears people to you, especially anybody who did contribute code. Make sure that you follow that. Now, we also want to assume that only people who we really want in the community think and uh, act just like we do. So if everyone is the same, then we know that, you know, hey, they're going to follow our rules. So if we make that assumption, we're going to also drive some of those community folks away. And also focus on rewriting what's working, quite frequently, actually. So things like, I'm going to stop all new feature development so I can redesign this in Rust over the next couple of years. That always really works really well for community involvement. And it really helps those who are in the user space. <coughs> yeah, right. Um, so make sure that you're always rewriting instead of focusing on things that are going to bring value to the community or the things that they want. Now, we all love to get rich. Who doesn't want to get rich, right? I think we all do. I think every aspiring supervillain wants to get rich. So make sure that you collect and sell user data, even though that might be illegal. We're supervillains, but people do it. Put profits above people and make sure your community, you take as much as possible, but remind everyone that your goal is revenue. So report that all the time. Expansion, woohoo, look at this, we got net retention. That's a great way to make sure your community starts to dwindle. Flame wars are also fun and entertaining. So if you're going to have a flame war, make sure it's very public and you pull it out at the appropriate time because there's nothing better than watching someone go down in flames. And remind people what you think of them often because they are beneath you. Now, one of the most loved supervillains, the Joker, he's often just on that non-logical, just nonsensical, I want to watch the world burn path. And this is something you can do in your open source project as well. So making random decisions, maybe even rolling a 20-sided dice to make sure you decide on what's going to happen next in the community. These are the things that can work to your advantage. Now, we can put this all together in a very cohesive play. And our supervillain Hall of Famer that we're going to learn from today is the Emperor Palpatine. Now, how many people are familiar with the Emperor Palpatine? Okay, 
Oh, come on. There's a few more that I want to raise your hand. Star Wars villain, okay? He was the senator, and then he really was the evil villain the whole time, but he pretended to be good. Now, we can learn from Emperor Palpatine. He played all of those things that I mentioned off beautifully, wonderfully. And what did he do? Well, let's walk through this. Let's walk through the Palpatine playbook for destroying an open source community. Number one, start off as part of the community, respected. Oh, we want to hear you talk. We want to come to your conference. We want to use your software. This is wonderful. You want to be part of that because that's just setting the stage. Number two, and start to introduce a few more regulations. Maybe a CLA here and there that has some weird language. Maybe a little bit of license managing, things like that. Just a little bit. Just give it a taste to see what the response is. Number two, create an enemy of a subset of users and blame them for all of your problems. Okay? Make sure that it is that scapegoat mentality, but you take that subset of users and say, well, they're preventing the project from moving forward. And so you need that quote unquote enemy for everyone to rally behind. And it will make you look better. Now, create a new license and move some tools and some fringe software to use it. And then blame someone else. Maybe the cloud, maybe someone else. Ah, I need to move these, th these things over. Then change your contribu uh, contribution guidelines from, uh, and your CLA to be more restrictive and more protective because you are going to need that later. Start reserving, ooh, look at that, man, quick. Start reserving new features. Wow, that just went automatically. Well, I was going to do them one at a time. But start reserving new features and bug fixes uh, for the cloud or enterprise versions, right? You don't need them all out there. Convince your investors, customers, and a subset of criti cr critical maintainers that you have to dump true open source, and you need to come up with a brand new license, which has nothing to do with open, but you're going to brand it as open because it's not open source, it's open. And then everyone will believe that it's open source even if it isn't. So this is very important. <laughs> ah, yes, yes. Uh, um, and you should be very litigious and you know, prevent others from thinking that your license is too open, right? So you don't want them to copy your code or do anything that's going to potentially limit your revenue stream. So go ahead and you know, be litigious there. Then engage in flame wars against those who are potentially more open than you and tell them you know, how, how bad they are for potentially minimizing your things. And then you wanna maximize your profits, right? You wanna, you wanna drive efficiency by all means necessary. You wanna steal from other folks and you wanna make sure that everyone knows that while you're still quote unquote open, your version of open is the right way. And if there is a rebellion, crush it. And that's the Emperor Palpatine playbook. And that's your 25 minute super villain guide. And I have questions now. Uh, you forgot a simple move. What? You could have put the trademark and the website into your own private LLC. This is true. I have seen this. Yes. Yeah. Because trademark, you know, yes. Yes, you can do trademark squatting. Yes, that's a very good one as well. Anybody else have any good super villain plays that I missed? I'm sure that there's others. I can't be the only one who thinks that these are all the supervillain plays. Okay, well, that's okay. Oh, oh, we have some questions back there. Oh, got a mic. Yes. Well, yeah, you you can definitely like introduce security backdoors either from um, governments or um, just from oh, random yes. third parties. Uh, how and I that's brilliant. That? And then don't yes. publish them. That's great. So yes, you're right. Absolutely. You know release regular software that works really well and then put a patch out there that blows everything up that relies on it when it updates. Oh my God, how can I forget that? You're a genius. I, a plus, can we, can we get him a A plus on that one? Because that is spectacular. You're right, that is awesome and the back doors totally work. Leave the bugs, don't fix the bugs. Uh, when you make changes or want to do something, you've always got to provide data, but your data can doesn't have to make sense, and the interpretation doesn't have to uh, follow. You ah, yes. So we can return random garbage data. Another wonderful play. You know that. You know if we are correct, ninety-five percent of the time, it's okay in financial institutions, right? Totally legitimate. 
As long as we're filtering that, that, that error in my favor into my bank account, I'm happy with that. Any other questions, comments? Or should I put on my other hat if somebody wants to ask me a serious, non-supervillain question, I can flip hats again. All right, I appreciate it. Hopefully you enjoyed the supervillain workshop. Oh, I don't know if they'll let me put it back up, but I can, yeah. I, yeah, I don't think they're gonna let me put it back. Oh, wait, here we go, okay. Back to like the contact details. All right, so look at that, we're going in reverse. It's so awesome. Did you know that this can go in reverse? I should probably just flip to it, but now I'm going through it so quickly. Here we go, we'll just go to this. All right, this one, right? All right, fair enough. There you go. And they probably won't invite me back now because I just broke every law and you know policy that you know the UK government has or any international body by recommending these things. So, all right, good. If anybody needs any, okay. any questions? No, we're good. So obviously now we all know what we're going to do. PJ is going to tell us what we're really going to do. <laughs> so. Uh, our next speaker is, um, oh, she says pick up, the, I'm really not doing this very well, am I? Right, so we have PJ Haggerty, who is going to come and talk to us. So PJ is a dev advocate from Spotify, and uh, he says he's known to travel the world speaking about programming and the way people think and interact. He's a developer, writer, speaker, musician, and community advocate, and he is also known for wearing hats. It seems to be a bit of a theme this afternoon, so. We'll let the, uh, the switch, the IT switch happen. Let me just get this set up here. There we go. So hey everybody, uh, as, as mentioned, my name is PJ Haggerty. I work at Spotify. I hail from the lovely town of Buffalo, New York. How many of you have been to Buffalo, New York before? How many of you know where Niagara Falls is? We're the city just lower than that. Um, so if you know New York City, I don't live anywhere close to there, so don't ask me questions about New York City. Uh, but I do work with the developer experience team at Spotify. Um, we do the, basically we work on the Spotify API. So if you want have any questions about that or you want to check it out, developers.spotify.com, you'll find all of your answers. But that's not what I'm here to talk about. Talk about. Um, I do do a lot of talks. I travel around a lot doing, doing talks because I'm in developer experience, developer advocacy. And one thing that I've always found is great to set up expectations right at the beginning. So we're going to start by taking a look like where open source was at the beginning. And we'll use that as a jumping off point to see where things were meant to go and where they didn't exactly go and how maybe some good intentions with bad execution mess things up uh, for the way things are today. Then we'll look at what it means to use and produce open source in an ethical way. Uh, what does that really mean? And we'll kind of extrapolate what it means to do that as a participant in open source, as a community citizen, as a, someone who has a job who does open source regularly. So that seems like a lot to do in 25 minutes. So let's get started. So this image of a developer, an open source developer, was like the quintessence of what people thought of open source in the early 2000s when the meme first started. Um, you know, working in the basement, smoking, white guy, panel background, very thing. To say that this was like so inaccurate when it became a meme in the early 2000s is like kind of incredible. Um, it, but in order to find where things actually started with open source, we have to go all the way back to yeah. the time before widespread computer use and even the internet, uh, at least internet in our homes, back to the 70s and 80s. Uh, back then, computer scientists would often, you know, in the 60s and 70s, they'd often share software because there was no commercialization. 
No one was paying for Unix. It was just a thing that you needed. So if you needed it, you talked to your friend at another university and they would send it to you. You'd load it up and you'd get it started. It would take you a while because computers were slow and disks were heavy. Um, there wasn't a need for that. So people didn't really commonly commercialize software until at least the 80s. Um, at that time, there were also these you know, individuals or sometimes collectives who called themselves hackers and they would try to find this corporate software that was being shared and used and they would try to get a hold of it. And the thing that I find interesting there, and it kind of shows how things change, is when I was young, a hacker meant someone who would probably partake in semi-illegal activities in order to gain or create software. Now it's a tag you can put on your LinkedIn page. I'm a hacker, I'm a growth hacker. I'm not a growth hacker and I would never call myself one, just to be clear. I don't mean to malign people, but you can see that things change. When I was growing up, a hacker was someone who was like hardcore. They were for real. They were totally in the back door using different networks to get things. And now it's literally something you can just kind of call yourself. Um, so just as things were beginning to kick off, Steve Jobs and the Waz were in a garage putting together the Apple II, first one that was going to have a, G a GUI interface and you could use it at home. And you know, Bill Gates was trying to convince Pope, folks that Altair Basic was the interpreter of the future. Something started to happen in the background. Less of an entrepreneur and more of just like a generally good guy, uh, Donald Knuth published a thing called Tex, which is a typesetting language for programmers. And he did it for free. He made Tex essentially the first modern piece of open source software. Anyone could use, run, edit, customize Tex the way that they wanted to. Um, so these big business people in the background, these profiteers are looking for an opportunity on how to sell and, and make money. And Don realized that he could have better software not more expensive, not you know, more pricey, but better software by giving it away and creating a big user base. To say the least, the summer of 1979 was a crazy time. Um, I was three, so I don't really remember it that clearly. This is a talk, folks. Um, but text was like a drop in the bucket. Like it didn't make a huge splash. But it, think of it as kind of like you know, creating a little snowball at the top of a mountain and just kicking it downhill and seeing what happens. A few years after Don released Tex, a group at MIT's Artificial Intelligence Laboratory built an alternative operating system called GNU. We could argue for days, I know it's an open source conference, we could argue for days how you pronounce this. I'm going with GNU, we'll deal with it later. The goal was honorable though. Make a free software operating system that anyone could use. The one difference between Tex and GNU though was Don just kind of did it and tell people about it, word of mouth. The folks behind GNU, they wrote a manifesto. Now, manifesto, there's a powerful word right there. When you write a manifesto, stuff kind of gets real very quickly. Um, so they wanted to let everyone know this is open. It's for programmers. You can view. You can edit. You can change the way you run it. You can customize it for yourself. You could modify it for better public use. No one could profit from this, but profit wasn't really the point. So this led to an interesting push in the 90s. At this point, languages being used in modern mainstream computer programming which really wasn't that common in the 90s. Most people still didn't have a computer in their home. There definitely weren't laptops. I mean, like, there are a few, but we could tell stories about that. They, they weighed about 45 pounds and they were incredibly heavy. But the 90s brought us something new. We had operating systems, but what if we could have programming languages that we could improve as we saw fit? So again, while well, Microsoft is writing the foundations of Visual Studio and pushing languages like C++ and Visual Basic because it made the money, and Apple's starting to create this empire of weird hardware making computers that kind of look like bowling balls, but they're translucent, and everybody's like, that's cool, I can play Oregon Trail on a powder blue bowling ball. Um, in the background, programmers wanted something more. So the arrival of Linux and other alternate OSs like Norton Commander, did anyone use Norton Commander? I still love Norton Commander, it's the best. Um, in 1991, it meant there were no longer, we weren't tied to our operating system for, as soon as we purchased a machine. We didn't have to use Windows 3.1, which also meant that we could look outside of the proprietary languages being used in the corporate environment. Ruby was conceived of in 1993 um, as a language that made programmers happy. That was the goal. Um, as the web became a major player in the market, we got a way to build that with PHP. Both of these were built on a thing called Perl that Larry Wall built in 1987. So we're already starting to see, like, there's big growths in computer languages. Why would people want open source languages? But it's weird to think that three of the most foundational open source languages, all three still in heavy use today, started in the late 80s and early 90s. Maybe that kind of speaks to the lasting power of open source projects and how we tend to build communities around them. But we'll touch more on communities later. 
Um, all this, again, it stayed relatively quiet and in the background. People didn't really know about it. Hack hackers and collectives and hobbyists and enthusiasts, they all knew about it. And it was even hit and hinted at the ridiculous portrayals of programmers and hackers in the media. Literally the movie Hackers. How many of you have seen the movie Hackers? If you haven't watched it, it's absolutely terrible. Um, maybe the worst thing Angelina Jolie ever did. Um, but then one media company that decided, hey, maybe we should publish books for developers. I think they're Irish. They're called O'Reilly. Um, they published a book by this gentleman called Eric S. Raymond called The Cathedral and the Bazaar. And it introduced the concepts that were behind open source to the entire world. And the concept he introduced was simple. There are two different types of development models. The cathedral model, in which source code is available with each software release, but code is developed between releases. It's done by a restrictive group that is exclusive, exclusively software developers. This is where GNU falls in, Emacs, uh, when it first came out, GCC. Then there's the bizarre model, in which the code is developed over the internet, which this is, again, this book came out in the 90s, and people were like, the internet, tell me more about this. The, the, all in view of the public. And Raymond provided as an anecdotal account his own implementation of a thing called fetch mail, which is an old project. So the interesting thing is, and they point out, the cathedral model is great, but you can find bugs more quickly if you let everybody take a look. You can get testing, review, all of that done by the general pro pop public if it's available to everyone all the time. At the time, GNU wasn't available to everyone all the time. It was only restricted to the people who had programmed GNU and they'd put it out and then you could customize it on your own machine. That would be the cathedral model. So, thus far, here we are. It's the early 2000s. Everyone's listening to NSYNC and the Backstreet Boys. Everything's pretty idyllic. It's great. It's rosy. Software language and operating systems built for everyone. Naturally, this would level the playing field. No longer was development and computer science a rich person's game. Now, granted, uh, you kind of still had to have access to a computer and some disks because load even loading something proprietary like Visual Studio was several disks long. Um, there was no cloud back then, but no one could essentially stop you. There was no governing body to say no. And this is where we hit our first snag. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, this non-hierarchical utopia came with a few problems. And we start with toxic actors. People who through various means like misogyny, poor social behavior, sexism, racism, and the belief that they were so much more intelligent than everyone else. Mm -hmm. These people made the world of open source a very closed and unhappy place. So even the leader of the Electronic Freedom Foundation, whose name I will not say out loud, is a person who has such reprehensible values that people are unwilling to be involved in the Electronic Freedom Foundation. That kind of says it all. In fairness, some of these people pictured and others that I don't have pictured have learned from their actions. They're really only one of the ones pictured has moved the needle in only a little bit. Um, these people have made it super hard for people to get into open source. Uh, they believed in the meritocracy. We talk a lot about the meritocracy. And it seems the first merit was looking an awful lot like yourself and sharing the same often narrow worldview. That is not a great way to build a community. Luckily, though, to counteract that, most of the world moved on. We didn't want the concept of the benevolent dictator for life. We didn't need that model anymore. We don't need the direct creator of a library or a package manager or a language even to be involved. If they become a distraction, it's not worth it. At the heart, we build software. Whether that's web applications, mobile applications, operating systems, DevOps scripts, doesn't really matter. Whatever it is, you tend to, especially in open source, build a community around the thing that you've built. Not just users and developers, but people who really care about these things. Um, and when we participate, we participate as much as we wish. But we need to do it in a way that keeps the gates open for people who come behind us. And that's what kind of avoiding that benevolent dictator model helps. Um, I do feel like I'm saying everything the opposite of what Matt just said in his talk. Um, like many things that are created by communities, though, there was initially no way to govern any of this. Um, Windows OS came with an end user licensing agreement that's as long as my legs. And I know I'm not tall, but my legs are long enough to be a long EAULA. Um, Apple was so lawyered up that they actually sued Windows over the concept of a clickable user interface. There's a great movie called The Pirates of Silicon Valley that goes through all of this in a slightly fictionalized way, but it's only slightly fictionalized. Open source had none of this. And in the beginning, we didn't need it. Um, there was no need to worry, because it was really just the community using it. So that's cool. But as time wore on, as larger organizations got involved and began using it, um, who owned what and, and what, who was responsible suddenly became very important. Luckily. As folks really wanted to ensure that open source spaces stayed safe, the world of licensing grew. 
Uh, much of this started as large-scale or organizations like Red Hat and Apache grew and realized that just with their user base, they would have to have some sort of legal entity around what they're doing. Um, so of course they did what they thought best. They developed licenses that would keep the community safe, keep the software safe, and make it able to share. And then they did what every open source company does. They said, okay, well, we're gonna release this for free and open source the licenses. Good, cool, now we have a gov governing body. These days there are over, near, there's nearly 200 different licensing the license is available. And it's easy to find a way to stay so safe doing open source. I suggest you, if you really want to open source your software, look into the license that works best for you. There is no like overall arcing one that works, um, but there's ways to do this in an ethical way. So where do we stand today? Today, things have kind of branched out. So forms of open source operating systems have grown so far from the MIT GNU implementation, and they're so much more specialized. Linux is now a default on cloud servers, mostly through Ubuntu, but there's other options. GUI desktops in Linux are so common than, more than ever before that the linkages with standard Windows programs, so-called, um, are clear, it's super easy to use. Unlike 20 years ago where, and this might be an Americanism, but um, like you could buy the store brand cereal or you could buy like Kellogg cereal and there's, there's a difference. You know there's a difference in that store brand, but it works basically the same. Now it's still, it's very difficult to tell the difference. It's not that big a deal. But it isn't just the operating system or the desktop that matters. No, this is not the year of the Linux desktop. I'm not here to tell you. But software has gone open source as well. And there's so many open source languages in use today. I mentioned before Ruby and Perl and PHP. And from there, they often inspired most of the languages we use today. And we've seen continual growth in both functional and object-oriented languages. Things like Elixir, Haskell, Scala, Erlang, Go, Rust, Python, TypeScript, R, and Kotlin, along with Ruby, Perl, and PHP, are the most popular programming languages in use today. Um, I could just probably spend a half hour going on about the different flavors of JavaScript that people are using regularly. And no, many of them are not necessarily shiny and new by our 2023 standards, but at the same time, they've gone from being used by enthusiasts and hobbyists to being part of code bases for some of the largest corporations in the world. Um, and a major reason these languages have, have bumped up and the operating systems have flourished is an ecosystem of companies that need something that they can build sturdy, ready for production, low overhead, and right now. And I'm talking here about startups. Um, and I won't go into some of the negative aspects about startups, that's for another talk, but I will say without the startup culture, a lot of these ang languages would not have grown past the mid-aughts. Uh, it would just wouldn't happen. These companies often embrace open source because it gives them the ability to build an MVP, which is awesome. They can do it without worrying about, you know, they have to worry about the licensing, but they don't have to pay for an IDE. They don't have to build in a specific ecosystem. They don't have to worry about like a special corporate license or an EULA that's gonna get them in trouble. Anyone with a machine can build stuff. And again, I'm not trying to like glorify the one person in a garage can do anything. Um, but like the idea is there, you can get something started fairly easily and it grew from there. Of course, whenever startups do things, giant corporations start to take notice. Some of the largest in existence are suddenly the home to open source. Sure, some are only that way because they made purchases and that's okay. Uh, but if anything, the fact that those large scale corporations were making purchases to be part of open source shows you the value. When the old guard says, okay, this thing that we've rallied against for the past 25 years, we're gonna start thinking it's important. When I heard that Microsoft was gonna buy GitHub, I was shocked. I was like, they hate open source. They did like, and two months before that, they released a bunch of open source stuff. They started to sh send out the, uh, the Visual Studio Code, the VS Code stuff, and things were looking crazy. When IBM bought Red Hat, I, I damn near fell apart. I thought, this, oh, this is the end of the world. It's absolute madness. But it shows you that if these huge corporations care about it, they care about open source. They want to open source things and make the community a better place. Awesome, if they can do that, why can't you? And I say that in a very, I'm doing a talk at a conference way, I know it's probably not your decision. Um, the biggest shock was when government agencies started using uh, open source like crazy. Um, the thing that was most amazing about this is not so much that governments are using it because it's pretty cool. I don't know if you know, but like something like 70% of all systems in Sweden are open source. Any citizen can log in, grab the repo, change the healthcare system to make it more accessible, and if their PR is accepted, they've actually contributed back to their own society. That's crazy. Um, but the interesting thing is it's not just the people that are giving back, the government agencies themselves are contributing hugely to open source projects. Some of them are the largest contributors to open source in the world. Now, let's pause for a second here because you may have caught that the title of this is ethics and you may have caught the fact that the Department of Defense is on this slide. Um, 
So that's a whole other ethical issue. I'm sure people are always cool, like, NASA's using open source. That's rad. The European Space Agency, yes. Because how many of us got into this because you know, we thought computer programming would lead us to going to the moon at some point in time? I thought I'd at least get a ride on a space shuttle. I am not that kind of white people rich. Sorry. But it does become a difficult ethical stance when you're using the same project as someone like the Department of Defense or a police agency that's using the software to, to oppress people. So that's a judgment call. You have to find out more about your projects. It's not as simple as looking at something and saying, yes, that's for me. Sometimes you have to analyze a little more deeply. Um, before the big reveal on how to leverage open source in an ethical way, we first have to define what we mean by ethics. And here's a generic definition. It's a great start, but we want to understand how to best conduct ourselves, our business, our participation in open source in a correct and moral way. Often, our culture kind of invades that sense of morality. We have our personal sense, but then there's also like you know, corporate corporate initiatives and and you know big statements, mission statements. They say things like we're here to make the world a better place. I don't know what the hell that means because no but no company I've ever worked with has really made the world a better place. Spotify does though because we can give people music and that's pretty cool. Um, but how can we avoid some of the potholes and participate in open source ethically? And one of the biggest parts of consuming open source ethically is giving back. Um, so a lot of the companies that I mentioned earlier, both big corporations and tiny startups, have an issue here on what does this mean? Um, giving back can take so many different forms. Sometimes it's as simple as improving the ecosystem to make life better for other users of the open source project. Um, better community, building a better community, providing some space for a meetup, something like that. And there's also nothing wrong with paying. Now, some of you who are paying attention to the slides might say, PJ, you've put pay open source developers on that slide twice. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Because that's the most important thing. Um, and while those things get you started, you'll need to continue to focus on being a good citizen as an organization, not just as an individual. The, there's often expectations that we put on developers that are unrealistic. You should never expect a developer who's worked 40 hours a week to then spend 10 to 20 or 40 hours coding for free on an open source project. That is a ridiculous expectation. Forcing people into participating will never create a good environment. It doesn't help the community. It doesn't help the developer. It's a setup for failure, and it's a guaranteed road to burnout for the individual. Also, when you're building a team of developers, don't try to convert someone into being an open source contributor. Some people prefer to think of coding as a job. And that's OK. There's nothing wrong with that. You can't force passion. There's nothing wrong with focusing on development as a 9 to 5. Different attitudes towards work are required to get a better product and build better things. Someone makes it clear they don't want to join a community. Let them work on their own. One of the best ways to be a good citizen, and you'll notice this is back to those two things that I had on the slide earlier, is to donate to the cause. Um, this doesn't mean it's paying to play. A lot of people confuse paying for open source as paying to play. That does not, it's not the same thing. There's lots of ways to do this. Um, you can contribute to organizations to pay open source developers like Tidelift and Open Source Initiative. Um, they help open source maintainers get paid. Um, you can bring developers on your team as staff. It's something we did when I worked at a company called Engineard a few years ago. We were like, how can we help the Ruby community? Hire them, give them jobs, and then tell them, just maintain that thing. Just maintain it. You maintain that, that helps out our customers in the end. It all pays off. Um, think of it as sponsoring the project to ensure the ecosystem stays the way you like it. Um, open source projects are often maintained by individuals or small groups. I think we all know that. Even larger projects might have a governing board. You using an open source project as part of your product build does not entitle you to special access to these maintainers, especially if you are not providing them with any form of a paycheck. Even if members of your team are core contributors, your organization is in no way entitled to getting features or fixes simply because of your user status. The project is for the people, not just your people, but anyone currently using it, anyone who's ever used it in the past, and anyone who might use it in the future. Of course, the best way to participate in open source is to open source all the things. Um, maybe you have an auth system that was really cool and, and novel. Open source it. Maybe you had a cool DB connector. Open source it. Anything that is not part of your core business logic should be open sourced to its four. Spotify, we have a whole team that's dedicated to open source work. Uh, we believe no one should be forced to do open source work outside of regular business hours. Um, being a global distributed company, sometimes regular business hours, no one knows what that is. Um, we're currently working on metrics and things so we can learn how to bring more people into our open source projects and open source more of the internal closed projects so that more people can use them. Um, before you decide on how to get involved, you kind of need to understand 
what's in what's intuitive to a project, what makes sense for your company or your personal uh, what you're doing. Not everyone can be ready. Sometimes you have to find out if if a if a if a thing is viable. Does it hold up your standards of having a contributor covenant? Does it agree with your company's code of conduct? Um, do you understand all the components before you sponsor a meetup? Find out what level of participation is viable before you just jump into a tool simply because it meets your needs right now. There's also longevity. How many people remember the uh, left pad situation with Node.js a few years ago? Yeah, entire repositories, entire products were taken down because one guy was like, I don't feel like doing Node anymore. I'm going to take this out of the whole packet and then destroyed everything. You need to find out What's going to happen if a project gets abandoned? How important is it to your business logic? How important is it to your project's success? If it's in integral, find out more about how to get involved in that project because not all projects last forever. You also need to figure out how much you want to participate. Do you want to be someone who maintains that project? Or do you want to kind of focus on more of the aspect of building the community around the project to keep that going? A key, a, key, a key way to find out if an open source project is successful or if it's doing well or has good longevity is to look at the community around it. Um, I've mentioned Ruby a few times. I've, I was a big proponent of the Ruby community forever. Um, and it's interesting because a lot of people, you'll see articles, Ruby's dead, no one uses Ruby anymore, no one knows what Rails is, uh, it's just for boot camp students and things like that. Yet they still get 1,500 people every year at RailsConf. They get, 800 people every year at RubyConf, and they keep those numbers at those numbers so that more new people can come and get more information. That's a thriving community. Mm -hmm. The fact that they sell out every year tells you it's a thriving community. It's safe, it's stable. So keep an eye, eye out, and if you feel the need to step in, do that, because that's part of being a good open source citizen. That's part of that feedback. So to wrap it up, we kind of see where we started with humble beginnings, going back to all the way to the beginning of computer science as a mainstream way of life. We went through the 70s and 80s and 90s, building on the shoulders of giants like Donald Knuth uh, so we could make a better world for modern engineers. We made some major slip-ups. We continue to make major slip-ups. Sometimes we forget that the idea is for the entire world to be a better place, not just our corner of it, um, or just the people that look like us. We need to focus on bringing more diversity, more equity, more inclusion into the things that we do so we can actually build better things. We know we're now at least on stable ground. We weren't the beginning of the 2000s. We can build the things that we build for everyone and share a bit of knowledge and code when we have the opportunity. I hope everyone sees this isn't some like anti-capitalist rant and free will and let the code flow and like hippie bullshit. But like this was a way of looking at open source differently than those who came before us. And in some cases, they put a bad name to it. Um, here's the part where I'm supposed to say something's like super inspirational. And it's the last few slides. I have to make it seem like I came with this whole idea like on a Tuesday after a couple of beers. Like, but I'm not going to do that. My job was to lay out the facts. The inspiration's in your head. It's in your hands. Um, to use a sports metaphor, the ball is in your court. I don't know what the sport is. I don't know what the ball is. And I don't know what the court is. But it's yours. Do with it what you must. Um, but as you start to make that decision on what to do with that metaphoric proverbial ball, Know that you're armed with the knowledge of what open source is, what it can do for you, and what you can use it for to make a better world. And with that, thank you very much. Any questions for PJ? Ian? Yeah. I, hang on, Ian, we just coming. get the mic to you for the yeah. people who are streamed. OK, yes, I guess for the live feed. Um, yes, I'm going to ask the question that you skirted by. Okay. Open source um, a application software out there in the world. Um, what if a project you've worked on and helped develop is indeed then uh, being open source taken by, let us say, Mossad and then used to persecute people? How do you square that? Ethically, what so you know, I mean, yeah, what, ethically, what I mean, do you have I think, you I think that it? what happens is you basically at that point come to a crossroads. And I, I did skirt it limited time, such and such. I could, I could that's my excuse. Um, the issue that you have to then come to terms with is do you want to fork this and use a repo that has nothing to do with these oppressors? Do you want to try to create and build this completely separate project that does kind of the same thing or exactly the same thing but under a different name? <laughs> You have to figure out what works best for you, your project, your organization, or whatever. Um, and it's often tough, because a lot of these things did not come to light until a lot of whistleblowers started to step forward to say, hey, you know what? I don't know if you know this, but Chef is used at the Department of Homeland Security, and they're like the worst. 
And the person who announced that lost his job, lost you know, a lot of friends in the community because they're like, why do we care? Because some people don't know why we should care about ethics. So it's, it's kind of a personal decision. That's part of the reason why I kind of glossed over it because there's no, there's no umbrella act answer to that question. Um, the best thing in my mind, in my opinion, to do is to fork it, change the project, make it work for you, reopen source it, find a license that works. Um, there are licenses that specifically state that this software cannot be used by a government agency. Um, so, th and there's a possibility that you can do it to a point where you can avoid uh, bad actors using it as much as possible. Does that make sense? It's probably as good an answer as I yeah. gave. <laughs> Then get, do you then get a bit of Oppenheimer guilt? Oh, without a doubt. Yeah, without a doubt. Yeah. Um, I have a good friend who developed a, an open source thing that he found out was being used by not just the, he thought it was just like one police precinct in Berlin, but it turned out to be all of the police in all of Germany. And he ended up going with a separate license, a new license, which I know that in the previous talk was mentioned changing your license is an evil thing to do for communities. But he made it so that the government could not use that, that software anymore. Um, but yeah, it's, it's super, it's super tough. It's a super difficult question. So there's an axiom of Western business that there's an obligation of management to deliver, to, to optimize shareholder value. Mm -hmm. And what you're proposing is basically guilt, you know, that, <laughs> we, that you should do this because it's the right and ethical thing to do, but does guilt Scale. Does guilt scale? Um, <laughs> uh, having been raised in a Catholic household, yes. Um, <laughs> but in all seriousness, um, it, when you talk to your shareholders, when you talk to people, and you say, "Hey, listen, we should," you don't you don't give them the ethical. You're never going to convince an Elon Musk that going open source is the right answer. He doesn't care how much money does it bring us. And the answer to that is, well, you see, if we open source it, there'll be more developers in the community helping us to build the product for no money whatsoever. And therefore, open sourcing is the better answer, shareholders. We can actually save money by not hiring more developers by having the community help us build. So it's kind of a different, you have to leave your ethics behind when you're talking to general like venture capitalists and things like that. They don't understand the concepts of ethics. Guilt doesn't scale in that direction. Guilt does scale when you're like, hey, you know, we're trying to build this thing to make the world a better place. Can you help us out? You can make developers feel guilty. You can never make board members feel guilty because they don't care. I'm going to totally get fired for saying that. <laughs> uh, is the project still open? Oh, go oh. ahead. We have a Canadian standoff. <laughs> is a is project still open source if you're restricting who can use it? So for context, I work for the Met Office, a UK government agency. Is it still open source? if you're restricting the people who can use it. Yes, it's open source. It's not open to everyone. The reason why that has to be a thing is because of the things that we've seen over the past 10 years. Um, things like the situation between Elastic and AWS, where a corporation totally abused the license and they had to change it so that they could make it for developers again and not for Jeff Bezos. Um, it's unfortunate because maybe I should have done this talk 20 years ago and maybe some people would have picked up on it. But it, it, open source has to be, it has to have those guardrails. If it doesn't, it does completely get out of hand. And, and that sucks, and I totally don't agree with it. But it's the only way to kind of keep the bad actors out. In some ways, like having a conference these days without a code of conduct, you wouldn't even think of it. So we're sometimes restrict, restricting access to keep out bad actors is something you have to do. Uh, no, I'm sorry, that's not open source. So, I mean, if, if, if you have clauses that say that anyone cannot specifically, cannot use your code, it's not open source, it's not free software anymore. And, uh, I mean, as much as I... Then what is it? Yeah, it's closed software. I mean, Because it's not, be again, the words are open source. The no, source is open, the code is open. No, I'm sorry. There, there but have the, been but decades the of discussion around that. Uh, you, you, it's open source if, you, if it has a license approved by OSI. 
and, and, and explicitly that includes freedom zero, so that the software is free. Because maybe, I mean, some of us maybe don't have a problem with, uh, with governmental agencies, but maybe have it with uh, com surveillance com sure, uh, sure. That's companies. Sure, sure. Uh, yeah. But if we start making this exception, we destroy the projects, basically. We destroy the value of open source. So the, the value is exactly that everybody can use it without the developers being able to say, yeah, I like you and I dislike you. So that maybe instead of the license, we change the, uh, the contributor, uh, the code of conduct, because that would make people avoid it as well. Right, yes. One more question. Uh, I'm just wondering whether business would understand risk rather than guilt. Oh, businesses 100% understand risk. So they'd spend, they'd spend money on risk Most and de-risking. Yeah. Um, the thing is, like, and that's, that's the interesting thing. Like, that's actually what prevents a lot of large-scale organizations from joining open source because they feel that it is a risk to say, anyone can help us develop this thing. Because you can't, you know, you can't bring, and theoretically you could, but most people don't, you can't bring a community of open source developers and say, hey, we're talking about this, you know, this auth piece that we built that everyone has access to. Let's get on a meeting and, and set up a, uh, you know, a roadmap and set milestones. You can't do that when your open source project has you know, 2,000 people working on it. No one's going to pay attention to that. Um, so that's, like, that's the risk that they, they feature on. You can't hold that again and say, listen, if, you know, if we open source this and we don't support it and we don't have things going on, the builds are going to be slower. But I mean, that's just turning risk into guilt. So. <laughs> right. Thank you. Why don't you think there's broader adoption of ethical open source license, like a Hippocratic license or different licenses that say, you cannot use this to create harm. The Kiwi Farms is a great example. Kiwi Farms is a perfect troll, example. They're a troll farm. We can butcher and badger these companies like Cloudflare as much as we want, but they keep sticking to their horrible transphobic guns. But like, mm -hmm. why is there not a broader adoption or an adopting like the Adobe or the MIT license so that at least use does not cause harm or go against human rights or something. Right. I, I, think, I think that boils down a lot of times to ignorance. They just don't have people who under... And I don't mean ignorance to those communities that are, being, that are being marginalized. I mean ignorance to the way licensing works. They don't understand that there's more to it than just, hey, we're letting people use this. Like, they really need... At this point, if you really want to get a deeply specific, safe thing... You need a license, you need a contributor's agreement, not a CLA, but like the contributor's covenant is a perfect example. You simply need to say, we've adopted the contributor's covenant, now you've made a safe space. Anyone who violates that safe space can be booted. Um, we have a code of conduct, we have a set of rules that we follow at this organization. That's all that's needed, but a lot of people are not, like they, they're like, well, this sounds political. Pol politics is dangerous, we just want to make software. It's like, everything we do is political. Everything we do is political. But most people aren't going to realize that. So it's, 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 I shouldn't say it's ignorance. It's lack of education. Uh, most people are going, to, are going to use the Adobe license, the MIT license, because they have big names and everyone knows what they are. Um, but like anything that's going to be like less clear or have kind of muddy water is going to be less likely to be adopted just because they don't want to spend the time looking at it. But why isn't there a move to change the MIT or Adobe license within those organizations or within tech? I, I, think, there, I think there is some movement, but generally, like, like, like you said, it has to be within the organization. Pressure from outside doesn't necessarily work. It needs to be someone inside the organization who takes up the cause and says, I'm going to fight for this. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for a challenging and a good debate and good discussion afterwards and really making us think and take us back from being supervillains to being the good guys. Um, so thank you, PJ. And last but not least, I would like to invite Anna to come to the up. So Anna Jimenez Santa Maria is uh, from the uh, OSPO program manager at the To Do Group, uh, which is a Linux Foundation project uh, and an open community of uh, open source program office practitioners and organizations. Um, she's really interested in open source, inner source, community metrics, travels all over the place. She's a well-traveled speaker. And uh, when she's not doing this, she can find her doing uh, yoga or illustrating. So um, I'm not sure she's going to be doing that for us today, but uh, Anna, please, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much. Let's see if the slides comes up.
Okay, here it is. Well, uh, thank you so much for everyone who has stayed until the end. Uh, it's been a really tiring and, well, exciting, but also tiring uh, day. So thank you so much for, for being here. Um, I'd like to start this presentation talking about what is, what is this talk not about. <laughs> so I'm not gonna to be presenting about uh, why open source has won, why now uh, open source runs in software and software runs in open source. So there is a lot of interesting thoughts on that, a lot of research uh, on that. Uh, I'm not gonna be talking about uh, the typical motivators for organizations to start uh, getting engaged with open source, mostly about security, and also ways to drive innovation. Again, I think there are clear um, talks related with that already. I'm here to talk about open source sustainability, and more specifically, um, talk about ways to make it right within organizations. Um, before starting, so a story of my, about myself. Uh, well, uh, we already uh, uh, we already get the introductions, but I'm the for program manager to the group. But I was formerly at Viterja, so that is a uh, um, software development analytics firm company. In there, I get this deep knowledge in uh, OSPOs, in open source program offices, in our source adopting an uh, open source culture within the organizations. Um, and my masters in data science were focused on uh, how to measure the DevRel success, developer relations success of open source communities uh, with community health metrics. I'm involved in other open source communities and projects such as Chaos, uh, Inner Source Commons, DevRel Collective, or OpenChain. And in my other life, I'm a vivid illustrator and designer uh, using open source tooling like Krita and Inkscape. And I also do, um, I have an um, anime band uh, where I sing there and, and try to teach uh, cool stuff on Japanese. Anyway, so getting into the sustainability topic. Um, there are some questions I've heard around the open source community on uh, that are around sustainability. The first one is, well, how can organizations improve open source sustainability? Like we know as corporations and other uh, organizations, uh, there, there should be a commitment on, on that air, but sometimes the how it's difficult to, to, to start with. And also another, Another question that I've just put this day because uh, I attended to the Sustain breakout room and there was this topic about open source sustainability and how can organizations uh, do the things right uh, around open source sustainability was how can organizations sustain healthy existence? Because it's not about just making uh, open source in the long term in the organization and preserve that, but also how how can we make sure the organizations are doing it in the in a healthy way and not harming the open source ecosystem. So the short question, the short answer will be open source program offices, um, and see open source program offices as the vehicle to make that possible. But let's deep dive more into that. So what exactly is an OSPO? Because many of you, I'm sure you have heard many organizations claiming, I have an OSPO, I have, we have built an open source program offices, more like a, an, a trend thing. Uh, but it's more than that, it's more than a word. It's basically moving from this to this. Instead of doing open source ad hoc, instead of saying, okay, open source is there, and we are using open source, we know we are engaging in open source, and we are trying to 
put layers to fix something and then forget about open source because we don't think it's important. It's about having commitment on that. It's about making sure the organization knows open source it's here and it's here to stay. So you are given uh, resources and enough funding to build uh, metrics of experts, uh, people that will engage in open source to have a clear overview of um, the open source operations that happens within the organization. So it's basically that. It's a way to adopt a strategic posture around open source and act as the center of competency for an organization's open source operations and structure. But um, I've also heard so many people say, okay, I, I get that the value of OSPOS for organizations is clear, but is it really helping open source communities to thrive? Are, are they really helping on that? And um, I just wanted to point out to a recent research uh, from LF, um, LF Europe uh, that were um, analyzing the perceived change in the value of open source uh, from an organizational perspective. So those uh, respondents uh, that says that um, they have a um, clear and visible leader on open source strategy, uh, so the value for those that had an OSPO or similar um, open source initiative there uh, increased. And we can see that the ones that didn't, uh, that uh, perception of value was uh, lower in, in many ways. We also saw that by having an OSPO, uh, there was, um, there were, there were those that had an OSPO were more strongly disagree on the lack of policy, lack of understanding. So in a nutshell, they had more clear understanding on how to operate in those, uh, in the strategy and how to operate in those environments than those that didn't. Because yeah, we, we get that OSPOS can bring a strategic relationship with open source. So they have many. They can have many responsibilities. Um, they can manage compliance. It's one of the major issues uh, we find, at least in enterprises and those hospitals that are, are working there. Uh, also, uh, build a standardized process on how to contribute to open source, how to uh, launch new open source projects. Maybe for others, it can be the mean to achieve interoperability. Uh, and I said these are some of those because um, into the group we say that your OSPO is not my OSPO. So this is just like a set as a set of um, suggestions and how some organizations perceive value. Maybe others have different ways. Um, but they can also and they should bring a healthy relationship with the open source ecosystems. So don't say it as they can also, they are also bringing value to organizations, but they are there to act as the translators uh, with the open source community. So with these metrics of experts and coordinators, uh, they communicate with both, with the open source communities and also uh, with the internal uh, actors in the organization. So those can be, that can come in the shape of stakeholders, in contractors, business units, and teams. In a nutshell, they can bring different benefits, uh, such as uh, help to bridge the gap between the traditional software practices and the open source dynamics. They can bring continuity, so that the, prog the, like the uh, open source remains in the long term. They can also help to the creation and developer development of certain tools to enable this open source dynamics and collaboration. And they can also help with education within the organization that we will talk uh, in a while. So here are some recommendations and I want to highlight the word recommendations because as I said earlier, your OSPO is not my OSPO. 
Um, in fact, in, in the Judo community, uh, what we have are guidelines and try to uh, establish best practices, but there is no board template to build a NOSPO. So take this as, well, this is what in other organizations worked, um, but you can pick and choose uh, whatever fits to your needs. Because there are different ways to engage in open source. Uh, I'm sure everyone knows on that. Um, and a quick um, example can be the goals. The goals of the organizations can change. It's not the same if we are talking about to an enterprise that the goals are gonna be more business oriented or governments can be more social oriented to serve the citizens, for, for instance, can be a, a, a common goal or to achieve interoperability can be a common goal or to universities that maybe their goals can be more educational oriented. So each of those organizations can have different motivators to engage in open source and thus to be an OSPO. But the OSPO is gonna be that vehicle anyway. And of course, apart from that, uh, each organization, they have their own culture and values. They have their own uh, different sizes, different teams, and they have a history with the open source previously. Like there are some organizations that the open source um, culture, it's really in them and they clearly understand that, but there are others coming from traditional environments that maybe they started with some ad hoc efforts that then the project died somewhere and now they need to retake what they did and, and try to put order into all those, that chaos. So saying that, um, here are some questions uh, that an OSPO leader or the organization can ask when starting an OSPO. So first, where does the organization wants to use open source or where is the organization using open source? And what will the organization ensure uh, to achieve these objectives? Also, when thinking about building the OSPO, um, how will a minimum viable OSPO look for your organization? depending on the size, the funding you have, uh, the goals you're having, and also what will be part of this minimum viable OSPO, um, what kind of a staff, the resources you will need while uh, deep in dive into the OSPO, and why this plan uh, when creating the OSPO will and the strategy behind uh, will succeed for this organization specifically. So these questions is something that shouldn't be happening just in the, as, um, in the OSPO team or uh, in just one person, the head of the OSPO, but should be communicating uh, frequently uh, with, the or, uh, with the organization. So even though the OSPO is uh, a team, it should be acting also as an organizational level. Um, so some recommendations for starting this minimum viable OSPO. Uh, first things first, find a dedicated person. Um, I think this is something that has been working in many organizations. Um, and it's important to have a person maybe that is already in the organization and knows uh, the dynamics of open source, uh, but that is able to perform various tasks because an OSPO leader and an OSPO team is a multidisciplinary team. Also, um, build a matrix of experts. So as I said, the, the OSPO is um, engaging with the different teams on the organization, and should be, should, you should be thinking of how to define um, the actors that are gonna be engaging with the OSPO, and also the external collaborations. So the foundations you would like, your organization would like to engage with, those open source communities that, that, that can help you to navigate in open source, uh, the maintainers uh, from the projects you care most. Um, also around cultural change, 
uh, make sure if your organization doesn't know how to operate in open source to enable this open source cultural shift. Uh, some organizations start thinking on open source as a business model, and it's not. Um, and maybe some others just think like, yeah, this is a trend, uh, a, an innovation enabler that is right, uh, but they don't see it as a commodity. And it's becoming somehow that, because we've seen in, um, previously in my slides how most of the modern applications are containing already open source components. We are saying that open source is there, even though it's not tangible, uh, behind, uh, behind all the modern applications is there and organizations need to take action and commitment. Um, also, um, make sure to let the organization understand that um, Open source dynamics is a different way of working, is uh, a different culture, and that transition is gonna take time. And for that, um, there are many ways, of course, that the OSPO can, can work on that, but I would like to highlight one, of com one community that is in our source commons that is focused on how to enable this uh, open source cultural shift in organizations. That, by the way, they recently started a working group, an ISPO working group. So the same there is an open source program office. There are some organizations that are having an inner source program office, maybe within the OSPO, maybe outside. Uh, but don't forget about this, um, this concept. Don't forget about the, the cultural change on the organizations because if you build on top things and you forget about this baseline, uh, many organizations are gonna get lost. Oh my God, okay, now it's there, back. Okay, <laughs> uh, then choose the structure. Um, think about uh, with the resources you have, if the if this OSPO is gonna be a virtual OSPO, starting as a virtual OSPO, or maybe you ha you're a part of a bigger organization and you can think about making it um, uh, in the CDO and engineering team on the uh, human resources team and so on. There are different structures and depends on the organization. And another thing that is also working well for some organizations is work on the open source strategy document. Uh, one of the very first things to do as, as an OSPO team or as an OSPO leader. Because this is gonna help you to get everyone on the same page on an organizational level and which is more important, and this is dealing with sustainability uh, of open source in the organizations, preserve the open source strategy for new generations. I have many times organizations having an OSPO and then setting down the OSPO and maybe in three years we take in this. And uh, I think sometimes it's just about documentation. You, if you have everything documented, if the person that is the head of the OSPO uh, suddenly goes elsewhere, uh, the knowledge, the open knowledge can be kept in the organization for others to learn and to retake. Um, and in this open source strategy doc, there should be many, many things. Some of those can be, for instance, communicate what you consider a sustainable project for your organization, or um, make specify how you want the, con the employee contributors, if it's a uh, corporation, uh, use and contribute to open source projects. Uh, identify projects that are critical to the organizational goals, and also track and identify those dependencies that are gonna um, sustain these open source projects, um, define actors and external collaboration, and also specify how are you gonna be engaging with them. Um, and provide guidelines of, for making new decisions, like for instance, um, how can we make more open source advocates? The, my own is how can they be open source advocates and also give back to the community and not harming them. 
and uh, provide open source best practices to foster this uh, sustainable ecosystem. And um, there has been some discussions on, well, so the open source strategy docs should be just one, two, three. Uh, some organizations, what they are doing is having like a global one that answers the why and what, and it's more for an organizational level. And then they have the how-tos for every team. They are for those metrics of experts that are engaging in the OSPO. There are more as guidelines, checklists, and translates the general strategy. So this way, they are not working in silos, and they really know how to operate. So it's not the same talking with the marketing team than, for instance, with the engineering team. They need different wording, they need different way. There are things that they should be know, and there are others that maybe is, they are not, is not important for them. So having these micro how-to's guidelines can help a lot. Um, if you want to learn more about the open source strategy doc, uh, there are some notes that uh, we created as a community in the Ospology Live Netherlands. We did two weeks ago with all the open source communities and projects involved. And also there is a comprehensive guide on uh, different how-tos uh, for open source program management best practices and one of them talks about this open source strategy document. Um, also another thing to consider uh, is try to frame and to map where your organization is. Uh, this is an OSPO maturity model. As I said, your OSPO is not my OSPO, so maybe this works better for traditional environments, for other organizations that works on, like, uh, traditional software companies might, hear, might see, be like, okay, I already doing all everything. Uh, but for those traditional environments, maybe it can help them to search to the organization where are they and how can they evolve. Uh, over the years. So with this, um, we've seen uh, certain topics that can help organizations to build this minimum viable OSPO that can act as this vehicle to enable open source sustainability in organizations and to maintain open source operations in the long way. Um, but never forget that with all this checklist, uh, there are challenges that the OSPO has that they need to resolve in terms of culture, in terms of tooling, on process, and continuity. And this is not the talk I'm going to be talking on that. Uh, there, are, there is a presentation I did um, with uh, Thomas uh, from EPAN system about the minimum viable OSPO uh, a few months ago that you can deep dive in case you're interested to learn more about Okay, how to resolve those challenges, how can we work as an organization and communicate with the OSPO, and so on. So, uh, to end up with, I would like to share the different heads of the OSPO, because I think it can frame uh, in just three uh, strategic areas what uh, the OSPO can do with the, for the organization and also for the open source ecosystem and how can they, they can build healthy, um, healthy relationships with each of them. So the OSPO sometimes acts as the environmentalists in terms of their make it possible to have the open source efforts being sustainable in the long term. Uh, they can also act as the facilitator so they can communicate with the different teams uh, and also with the open source communities. So open source communities can come to them and uh, can, they can share feedback and they can bring that feedback and bring it to the organization and vice versa. And finally, they can act as the, cons the consular. So they can give advice on the different business units, on the different teams, on as I said, what open source projects should we be investing of or funding or what open source, uh, how can we uh, start um, collaborating more with open source communities, anything. 
Uh, they, are the, they should be the open source experts, the ones that have the knowledge and can help the organizations to not harm the open source ecosystem. Uh, here are some resources of, uh, in, that are available in the tutorgroup.org that are, is one of the many open source communities that are helping in the OSPO movement. And say that um, it's time for question. Thank you so much. It is almost party time, but I'm sure if uh, anyone has a question, we've got time for a couple of them. I was wondering if you had any advice for someone interested in joining an OSPO. Um, I have an engineering background, but I uh, have not really seen any, a lot of discussion about how someone ends up in an OSPO as a job. How someone ends up in an OSPO? Yeah, oh. like what can, one, what can a person do to join an OSPO? You know, what, what um, sort of background or anything like that? So to be clear, I'm not part of, the OSP, of an OSPO. Uh, I'm part of the community of OSPO practitioners. So I'm sure some people that has an OSPO can serve this better. <laughs> um, I, I, I really don't have a specific answer. Uh, I think people that are already running the OSPO can, can serve better feedback on that. Yeah, hi, I was just wondering whether you are aware of or what your opinion is around OSPOs being involved in, I guess, more adoption than procurement, but actually deciding to the CTO level at sort of advising on what open source projects um, companies decide to take up or organizations decide to take up mm -hmm. and evaluating the open sourceness of open source in many ways. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, that's clearly a license issue, but there's a big difference between Open Core and a community project, and do they have a role in advising on those sort of adoption elements within organizations? Mm. Um, I, I've just, oh, no, there is no slides. I was just sharing my slides. But anyway, um, I was sharing the, the OSPO model. I, was, I presented later in the States for there is uh, angle called leadership and how the OSPOs, uh, this model uh, is the um, yeah is the, the final output from the feedback that many organizations have in an OSPO served in this research in a research study that is called uh, the evolution of the OSPO. So those organizations were uh, saying, yeah, our OSPO acts as this strategic advisor uh, and and are advising the CDO on uh, how to operate in uh, open source and project governance, for, for instance, and what open source projects they should be uh, taking more care and give more love to them. Uh, so yeah, I, we've seen, at least from the enterprise view, uh, that that has worked and that there are many organizations already, if they are not doing that yet, the path is trying to become these strategic decision-making partners for the organization. which case looks like we're there. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your Thank questions. You. Thank you, Anna, for your, your really interesting talk. So that rank, rank, wraps up the conference part of the day. Obviously, the party downstairs on the third floor. Uh, I think a lot, lot of the uh, delicate experience areas are still uh, open for you to go and try out uh, the sim flight simulator and the uh, immersive sound, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Uh, and don't forget Jimmy Wales, 9:15 tomorrow morning, back here, and uh, look forward to seeing you tomorrow. <laughs>